Bienvenidos a la tercera conferencia internacional sobre longevidad y pensiones. Antes de empezar con el protocolo habitual de los agradecimientos a ponentes, asistentes y a nuestros patrocinadores, sí que me van a permitir que tenga una mención muy especial a quien es sin duda el artífice, el alma de que estas tres conferencias internacionales sobre pensiones se hayan podido realizar. Si hay un nombre que es una referencia en este país hablando de pensiones y de longevidad, es sin duda el profesor Erce. Y yo quiero darle las gracias a José Antonio por poner tanto empeño y tanta voluntad, tanta pasión, aparte de todo su conocimiento, en que desarrollemos eh, desde AFI Escuela todas las iniciativas sobre pensiones que culminan sobre todo en esta conferencia internacional. Muchísimas gracias, eh, José Antonio. Quiero, por supuesto, agradecer a los ponentes que nos acompañan esta mañana, a Seth, a Nuria, a Christopher y a Arun. Eh, José Antonio eh, se extenderá luego en la presentación de estos increíbles ponentes que nos acompañan esta mañana, de todo el lo que han publicado y toda su trayectoria a lo largo de los últimos años y contamos sin duda con unos ponentes de excepción para debatir sobre una temática que está en el eje, en el centro de la polémica sobre las pensiones y sobre la digitalización. Quiero, por supuesto, dar las gracias a Santa Lucía por un año más eh, ayudarnos con el patrocinio de este evento. Muchísimas gracias, Ricardo. Y quiero también agradecer a su equipo, que se han involucrado en coordinar, en difundir y en hacer que también esto sea posible conjuntamente con el equipo de la escuela. Así que muchísimas gracias a todo el equipo de Santa Lucía. Y, por supuesto, quiero darles las gracias a todos los que hoy nos acompañan, a todos los asistentes, no solo que están en la sede de AFI Escuela, sino a aquellos que nos están siguiendo a través de streaming. Quiero invitarles a que tengan una participación activa, porque me consta, por los asistentes que he visto, que eh, contamos con también profesionales del máximo prestigio y entendidos en, en el tema de las pensiones y de la robotización. Y me gustaría invitarles a que todos tengan una participación activa, porque seguramente que también, conjuntamente con los ponentes, podremos eh, sacar muchísimas cosas en, en claro. El título de esta tercera conferencia que nos sugirió el profesor Erfe es ¿Pagarán los robots por nuestras pensiones? La verdad es que cuando nos lo propuso nos pareció algo absolutamente sugerente porque toma, toca dos temas centrales o dos tópicos ahora mismo que están sobre la mesa. Por un lado todo lo que tiene que ver con la viabilidad de los sistemas de pensiones en muchísimos eh, países en cuestión y con otro tema que preocupa y sobre lo que se está escribiendo muchísimo que es sobre el futuro del empleo, sobre la transformación del empleo y si la robotización y la digitalización van a destruir o no empleo y qué tipo de empleo. Sobre eso es sobre lo que esta mañana eh, vamos a debatir. Sin más, quiero daros las gracias nuevamente a todos los que hoy nos acompañáis, a los ponentes y especialmente al profesor Erce. Y cedo la palabra a Borja Foncillas, que es el consejero delegado de AFI y el responsable de negocio digital. Borja. Gracias, Mónica. Buenos días a todos y bienvenidos. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, eh, como no, agradecer a Santa Lucía que, que este año haya, una vez más, asumido el, el patrocinio de esta conferencia internacional sobre longevidad y soluciones para jubilación. Eh, Rodrigo, y si me permites, Jimmy, eh, muchísimas, muchísimas gracias eh, en nombre de AFI y estoy convencido que también en nombre de, del resto de los, de los asistentes. Bueno, en segundo lugar, me van a permitir que me dirija en su idioma eh, a nuestros eh, ponentes, a uh, eh, profesores eh, Benzel, Mayer, um, Moralidar. Thank you very much for your presence here. Well, I was going to say thank you to, to Nuria Oliver, but I think that it's also her second or first language, uh, English, so I'm not going to, to do it in, in Spanish. Uh, I would also uh, like to, to thank uh, Professor Babel and uh, Professor Erse, Miguel Erse, uh, for coming from so far to, to our uh, school and, uh, and also for your support in the organization of this event. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Uh, 
Bueno, para nosotros de verdad es un eh, absoluto honor contar hoy con, con, estos, con estos ponentes. Eh, los dos temas que nos ocupan hoy, eh, longevidad y, y dependencia, eh, para nosotros son dos asuntos de, de primordial importancia. Y, si me lo permiten, yo voy a tratar de poner en contexto eh, esta importancia en la propia estructura de, de, nuestra, de nuestra compañía, ¿no? Eh, nuestra área más veterana, que es análisis económico de mercados, que seguro que todos ustedes eh, conocen, trabaja de forma eh, muy estrecha con, con otra área de la casa, que es economía aplicada y territorial, que a su vez trabaja de forma muy estrecha con el, con el, profesor, con el profesor Erce. Eh, en estas áreas lo que tratamos de hacer es analizar y predecir el, el impacto de este drástico cambio en la fisionomía, eh, que está experimentando nuestra, nuestra población eh, y no solo eh, en cuanto a la perspectiva económica, sino también en las posibles soluciones a este, a este reto. Bueno, nuestra área de seguros, que también colabora de forma muy estrecha con el profesor Erce, pues tiene un mandato, tiene una, una vocación de ayudar a nuestros clientes a ofrecer soluciones, eh, soluciones a través de productos y y servicios eh, innovadores que acompañen a, a este segmento poblacional durante, durante ese tránsito. Nuestra área de, de consultoría bancaria, eh, de forma muy análoga al área de seguros, pues eh, está ofreciendo eh, este mismo tipo de, de soluciones. Nuestra área de asesoramiento financiero independiente, nuestra EAFI, está colaborando de forma muy activa y me alegra ver aquí a algunos de, de nuestros clientes a ayudar a nuestros clientes institucionales eh, a dar soluciones de asesoramiento y planificación a la jubilación también a, a este colectivo. Nuestra área de finanzas públicas eh, colabora, pues obviamente, con organismos públicos autónomos y centrales asesorando en materia de eh, políticas públicas. Eh. Eh, seguro que todos ustedes eh, han visto que el profesor Erce eh, es una gran parte de nuestra cara visible eh, también en este, en este ámbito, especialmente en los últimos, eh, en los últimos años. Eh, en, yo diría que en los últimos 30. Eh, bueno, y, y obviamente ustedes saben que yo compagino las funciones de consejero delegado del, del grupo con, con la responsabilidad del área de negocio digital, como acaba de, de decir Mónica, y, y obviamente… Hay un mandato en, en el área digital que es el de eh, canalizar este tipo de, de soluciones eh, y servicios a través de, de soluciones digitales. Por último, eh, no hace falta que les diga el compromiso que nuestra escuela tiene con la generación de conocimiento y también con la eh, difusión de, de este conocimiento, eh, no solo en, en, en nuestra sociedad, en la española, sino de forma eh, cada vez más, cada vez más, más global. Eh, Podríamos decir, en definitiva, que en, que en AFI tenemos un área eh, transversal de, de longevidad y dependencia. Y justo este enfoque multidisciplinar, eh, poliédrico, es el que consideramos más adecuado para eh, reflexionar sobre los retos y oportunidades que eh, nos está ofreciendo esta, ya no sé si decir nueva, eh, situación. Eh, en mi opinión, es imposible aportar soluciones en este ámbito sin contar con una visión absolutamente transversal ¿eh? y, si me permiten la palabra, eh, yo diría que holística. Eh, bueno, la muy, como decía Mónica, ¿no? la muy sugerente pregunta, eh, ¿pagarán los robots nuestras pensiones? Eh, a mí me parece absolutamente acertada y muy alineada con este, con este enfoque. Eh. Igual que me parece excelentísima la selección de de ponentes, ¿no? donde tenemos eh, expertos en investigación en inteligencia artificial, eh, alguien que va a venir a hablar de la reinvención de, de, de productos de seguros, soluciones innovadoras eh, de inversión y, obviamente, eh, impacto socioeconómico eh, de todo esto. Bueno, por último, eh, y yo en este caso lo voy a hacer en último lugar, aunque Mónica lo ha hecho en, en primero, no estábamos nada coordinados, siento avergonzar al profesor este de esta de esta manera, yo quería agradecer a, a José Antonio Erce, nuestro director asociado, no solo el esfuerzo e ilusión que ha invertido en organizar este, este evento, sino la enorme contribución eh, que José Antonio tiene al Grupo AFI en términos de generación de conocimiento, de aportación de visibilidad, de capacidad para agitarnos, para sugerirnos, eh, para provocarnos y casi siempre para eh, seducirnos. Eh, bueno, si todos siguiéramos el ejemplo del profesor Erce, que creo que muchos de ustedes saben que está jubilado, eh, con lo cual es juez y parte, eh, 
en esta, en esta conferencia, yo creo que se diluiría una parte muy importante de los retos asociados a la longevidad. ¿eh? La, la dependencia también creo que contribuiría eh, enormemente. Eh, muchísimas gracias, José Antonio. Eh, muchas gracias a todos por su, por su asistencia y espero que disfruten de la conferencia. Gracias. Ahora tiene la palabra Rodrigo Fernández. Buenos días. En primer lugar, deseo manifestarles el agradecimiento de Santa Lucía a todos ustedes por su asistencia a esta tercera conferencia. Agradecimiento también a AFI y al profesor Erce por la organización de una conferencia sobre longevidad y soluciones para la jubilación que está ya sentando un estándar de pensamiento, anticipación y análisis sobre la jubilación del siglo XXI. Y un especial reconocimiento a nuestros ponentes de hoy, cuya presencia certifica el compromiso de la conferencia con la excelencia que ellos encarnan. Santa Lucía, habiendo recogido muy gustosamente el testigo del patrocinio exclusivo de esta iniciativa, marca también un compromiso con esa búsqueda de soluciones para la jubilación en el increíblemente exigente marco de una longevidad sin freno, a la que se suma la aspiración irrenunciable de todos los individuos a una jubilación tranquila y digna. Queremos tener algo que decir en este proceso de innovación social y de mercado al que nos acabamos de incorporar, desde una tradición muy larga y fructífera en otros campos del aseguramiento. Esta conferencia es, en nuestra opinión, el marco ideal de reflexión y la puerta de acceso a esa innovación que, en nuestra casa, perseguimos con AINCO, en todo lo que hacemos. Nuestra plataforma se llama Instituto Santa Lucía, a cuyo equipo y foro de expertos, algunos de cuyos miembros vio en la sala, queremos también agradecerles su entusiasmo. La consigna de la edición del 2018, pagarán los robots nuestras pensiones, no puede tener una respuesta inmediata, ni la va a encontrar en esta conferencia. Está pensada para provocarnos, como ha dicho Borja, para retarnos a todos en una reflexión profunda, porque tanto si la respuesta es afirmativa o negativa, el, que tenemos por de, el trabajo que tenemos por delante es intensísimo. Y no digamos cómo lo sería si no supiéramos responder a dicha pregunta. El reto que una longevidad creciente supone para nuestro cometido como proveedores de soluciones para la jubilación es enorme. Y la verdad, actuando como si fuéramos humildes, lo más benigno que deberíamos decir sobre nuestra industria es que las soluciones que hoy tenemos a mano no son buenas. O dicho de manera más positiva, admite un, hermor, un enorme margen de mejora, o no. O no, porque justamente hoy, aquí mismo, tenemos entre nosotros a grandes especialistas en la materia que estoy seguro nos van a dejar algo más tranquilos, que no plenamente. Porque esa búsqueda de soluciones a la que me refería apenas ha comenzado. Esta conferencia va a permitir que grandes especialistas en el campo de lo que se ha dado en llamar el futuro del trabajo o la inteligencia artificial se codeen con grandes especialistas en materia de soluciones avanzadas para la jubilación, procedentes de los ámbitos académicos, expertos y profesionales, que todos ellos comparten en una u otra medida. Nuri Oliver, Seth Benzel, Chris Mayer y Arthur y Arun Muralidar van a llenarnos por unas avenidas van a llevarnos por unas avenidas hasta ahora apenas transitadas, por las que aquí estamos. Y lo van a hacer del, desde el contraste multidisciplinar, desde la reflexión avanzada y desde la experimentación del mercado de las soluciones en ciernes para el siglo XXI. No hay muchas oportunidades como la presente para empaparse de aquello que se cuece en los principales laboratorios de pensamiento y de concepción de soluciones para la jubilación del siglo XXI. Solo puedo congratularme con todos ustedes, de que podamos disfrutar y aprovechar plenamente la ocasión presente. Muchas gracias de nuevo a todos ustedes por su presencia, a nuestros ponentes, por supuesto, por su excelente disposición de dar forma a esta tercera conferencia internacional y a AFE. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Rodrigo. Bueno, con esto eh, damos por inaugurada la conferencia internacional sobre longevidad y soluciones para la jubilación y damos la palabra al profesor Erce para que introduzca ya el primer panel de ponentes. Gracias. Uh, good morning to every one of you. Thank you very much to Santa Lucia, to my fellows at uh, AFI. And of course, to our speakers, I'm immensely uh, happy to have them here. I'm in immensely thankful to them for having accepted my invitation, Nuria, Seth. Uh, we are going to initiate this first track of the conference, 
uh, with this session we call uh, face to face. A face to face session in the tradition of our conferences so far is a friendly uh, contest of uh, opinions and views about the issue at hand. Uh, of course it is pensions, of course it is longevity, of course it is uh, retirement solutions. Um, but this year the motto of the conference is will robots pay for our pensions? Of course this is a question that has dozens and dozens of answers. So there's no simple answer. There's no a no answer. There's no a yes answer. And whatever we are able to advance in this conference this morning is going to help us to understand what's going on. What the hell is going on in this transformation that goes from longevity to the digital transformation? And I want to speak just about a couple of minutes about these two, ish, these two concepts of longevity and digital transformation before uh, telling you who are Nuria and Seth uh, and why are they here. Um, longevity, every 24 hours, we add five extra hours to our life. Five every 24. If instead of five hours, we would add 24 hours, every 24 hours, we would be immortal. <laughs> Can't you imagine? Would you, able, would you be able to stand your couple, your sons, your daughters, your fellows at work <laughs> at the university, at the departments, for the whole eternity? You won't, of course. You will find solutions. Uh, Longevity. If longevity were noisy, we, we wouldn't be able to sleep at night. Can you imagine? <laughs> those adolescents, those teens who suffer growth pains, they notice they are growing up. Every night, they wake up crying or, you know, feeling painful about uh, what's got, uh, happening to them. The same happens to longevity. If longevity were noisy, not painful, but noisy, we wouldn't be able to sleep every night. So that's longevity. That's longevity. And it's here to stay and to grow and grow and grow by the year, by the decades, by uh, that way. It's not going to stop because we humans are programmed not to stop this kind of uh, evolution. That's longevity. Now let's talk about the digital transformation. I tend to agree with the fourth, the fifth, the seventh revolution, but I prefer to uh, refer to a digital revolution as the third big revolutions that human beings have been experiencing since 200,000 years ago. The first one was the Neolithic revolution. It changed our mindset, our relationship to nature, our relationship to ourselves. The second big revolution that humanity has uh, enjoyed was the great, the big industrial revolution 200 years ago. It changed again our mindset, our relations to nature, our relations am among ourselves. And the very same thing is going on since the case ago with the digital re revolution. We talk about robots. Robots are here, we're living with them since 40, 50 years ago. And we know something about what this means. So we can infer what the future, not only the immediate future is going to be, but what the future is going to be. This is the kind of issues I want uh, Nuria and Seth to debate uh, among them and with, uh, with uh, every one of us. I will give uh, 15, 20 minutes to each of them to present their cases, and then we will devote a uh, few other minutes to debate uh, with them. I will be taking notes and then preparing questions for them. Uh, so this is going to be, as I said, a friendly face-to-face. Uh, -face. Let me uh, start, working, uh, start talking by uh, telling you who they are. Um, Nuria Oliver is... Uh, let me just find it. Okay. Uh, Nuria Oliver is Director of Research in Data, Data Science at Vodafone and Chief Data Scientist at Data Pop Alliance, uh, an outlet she will tell us uh, kindly uh, uh, what, what they are doing. She holds a PhD in perceptual intelligence. Take notice, perceptual, artificial intelligence. Uh, 
by, uh, by the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has worked as the first uh, director, scientific director at Telefonica, first woman uh, scientific director at uh, Telefonica R&D, and then um, she uh, initiated her career as uh, chief data scientist at Data, data Pop Alliance. In uh, 2017, she joined Vodafone as uh, her first, uh, the, the first data uh, director of research uh, in, in data sciences. Uh, she is fellow of a lot of uh, institutions, academies, most recently, and I, I, I really, I'm really sorry to have missed it. A couple of days ago, she became fellow of the Real um, Academia de Ingeniería uh, Española, uh, a very, uh, important and historical institution in, in, in our country, you may, uh, some of you may know. And uh, she received a award for uh, Women Engineer of the Year, uh, I don't know whether it was uh, 17 or this year, this very same Yeah, it same was year. just uh, two weeks ago, yeah. Two, two weeks ago, <laughs> too, okay. As you see, uh, she has uh, barely started to receive the, the award she, she deserves. Seth Benzel, uh, he's a, an associate, a postdoc associate, to the uh, MIT mm, Digital uh, Initiative, Digital Transformation I Initiative. He is very active in uh, telling here and there uh, about the consequences, the socioeconomic consequences of uh, digitalization, of the digital transformation. He has been co-authoring works with uh, Eric Brinkhoffson, uh, so both of them at the top of the the future of a uh, labor uh, group or club or gang, uh, call them uh, as, you, as you like. He, and as I said, he's very active. He has been taking profit of being here in Spain for visiting other locations uh, the coming days just to, to kind of uh, discuss this, this, these issues. So without any delay, I'm just giving the word to Nuria, who will uh, devote uh, 15 uh, common minutes to uh, expose uh, her case. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation. Uh, this is actually not my... Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, this is not my topic of expertise, so I'm just going to uh, take more the role of being an outsider to this and trying to bring my personal thoughts uh, on the topic. Before I do that, just to contextualize um, why I say what I say or where, where do I come from, I just wanted to quickly share with you what my actual expertise is. So as Professor Erthe has said, my area of expertise is in artificial intelligence and particularly on modeling human behavior from data using machine learning techniques. So I have modeled all sorts of human behaviors from all sorts of data. I started working uh, uh, building systems that could uh, look at people and recognize what people were doing. So this is uh, the first facial expression recognition that I built back in 96, and it was probably one of the first facial expression recognition systems in the world that was working in real time. And today we can see systems like this that are commercially being used. Then I focused on modeling human interactions because we humans are social beings and understanding computationally interactions is important, but it is way more difficult than understanding individual behaviors. I also worked on a smart car uh, that was able to predict the most likely maneuver, which uh, was like way before anyone was talking about sort of like autonomous driving. And since 2005 or so, I realized that the most personal computer was the mobile phone. And if I wanted to build technology that understood us, people, the phone was the actual computer to use. So I've been working on, on making phones to serve their name, smartphones, have done projects on, on, uh, on healthcare, on credit scoring, on crime detection, on malaria in Africa, and even I've built a system to detect boredom uh, on the mobile phone. So this is some of, sort of like where I come from. So it's highly technological, but always uh, very human centric. My goal and my dream is to develop technology that is able to understand us as a necessary step to be able to help us. And the other area that I work on is how can we use technology to help us understand ourselves better? Um, so both technology to 
understand that so we can help us, so we can design systems that are useful to us, but also how can we use technology to actually better understand what's going on in the world and understand us. So with this context, uh, I looked at this question, will robots pay for, pay for our pensions? And then I thought, okay, I think there are three important uh, concepts here that you know, we can think about, and that's what I wanted to present today. So if we look at the first word, uh, the second word, the first big concept is robots. So robots is a technological sort of like construct, so we need to look into where we are from a technological perspective. And then we're talking about pensions, which is sort of like a societal construct, but it involves individuals, it involves human beings. So I just wanted to very quickly share with you my thoughts on these three dimensions, the technological, the societal, and the individual. And just before I start, so how many, is there anyone here that has a background in like artificial intelligence? No? Okay. Because on the technological part, I explain a little bit about artificial intelligence, so if people already know, I can go really quickly. So where are we? So as Professor Erthe said, you know, we are living in this big revolution that is happening, and some people, like the founder of the World Economic Forum, they call it the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and it is a revolution that is happening because we are able to mix the physical, the biological, and the digital world in a way that we have never been able to do before. And technologies that are enabling us to do that include artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology, the Internet of Things, you know, 3D printing, etc. So why is artificial intelligence at the core of the Industrial Revolution? So before I tell you why, I thought I would tell you what is artificial intelligence. Because in my experience, I find that everyone talks about it, but not that many people know <laughs> exactly what it is. So if we look at the definition that McCarthy gave in 56, which was the, one of the founders of artificial intelligence in the famous Dartmouth Convention of 56, he said, artificial intelligence is the science and the engineering of building intelligent machines. So he didn't really think very hard to come up with that definition. <laughs> uh, so the question is, what does it mean to be intelligent? What is an intelligent machine? So usually we take as a reference human intelligence. And we think, OK, so it would be machines that are able to interpret and interact with the real world. And there we have computational perception, which is like one of my areas. So computers that are able to observe what is happening, and recognize what is happening, and decide you know, what's the best thing to do. But it doesn't have to be an actual robot. You know, it can be, uh, as I will explain later, you know, actually most of the AI that we use today is invisible. So one suggestion that I have, I would change the title. Between robots, I would remove it. I would say AI instead of robots. But um, the ability to search for the best solution, the ability to reason and to plan, the ability to learn, to adapt, as we know, human intelligence is multiple. We have many different kinds of intelligence. So if we want to have an artificial intelligence, it should also be diverse. You could have to have emotional intelligence and social intelligence and all these other kinds of intelligences. So typically, we talk about three types of intelligence, of AI. The one that we have today, which is called narrow or weak AI, which means that we have systems that are really, really good at one thing, way better than humans, but they are only good at that one thing. And in many cases, don't even know what that thing is, meaning the best chess player in the world has been a computer program for many, many years now. But that program doesn't really know exactly what chess is or, you know, would have difficulties if we decide to improvise and suddenly change, you know, the rules of chess. Uh, but it's way better than a human. The goal for many of the AI researchers is to have general or a strong AI which would be an AI that has this similar level of capability that human intelligence. So it is multiple, it is adaptable, it is efficient, it is continuous, it is incremental, it knows about many things, it can associate concepts, you know, it is constantly learning, and so forth. In my view, we're very far from getting there, but we don't need to get there for AI to have impact, because today already AI is having massive impact. So I think it's very important to understand we don't need general AI, for AI to have impact, and we are pretty far from general AI, from my perspective. And then there are authors, and this is relatively controversial, that propose to go beyond human intelligence. It's like, why should we stop in human intelligence? You know, with Moore's law and the increase of computation, we could conceivably think of having an artificial intelligence which is superior to human intelligence, and that's the concept of superintelligence. And one of the most famous promoters of this is Nick Bostrom in Oxford, 
And it is, I think, by definition, impossible to exactly understand what this means because it's superior to us. So it's the same as asking an ant, how do we behave, you know, or how is our intelligence? So traditionally, and I wanted to say this because very few people talk about this, and I think it's very important. There has been two schools in AI since its very beginnings. There has been a school called the top-down or the symbolic AI or the needs uh, uh, approach. And there has been another approach, which was the bottom-up or the scruffiest approach. The top-down approach says that we want to achieve AI. We need to program predefined rules, and we need to use the principles of logic to be able to build a machine that would be smart. Whereas the bottom-up approach thinks, well, no, you know, we humans, we learn from experience. You know, what we need is to inspire ourselves in biology, and we need to actually have computers that can learn from data, that can learn from experience. And they are the, the most, uh, the, like the paradigmatic approach in the bottom uh, uh, approach is the neural network, which uh, was stopped being popular back in the, I guess, I don't know, 70s, and now is the huge comeback of neural networks, as I will explain later. So in the same way as human intelligence is diverse, artificial intelligence is very diverse. So on the top-down approach, we have game theory, logic, optimization, reasoning, knowledge representation, automatic planning, learning theory. There is many, many fields within AI. And there are hundreds of researchers working on these topics. And then on the bottom-up approach, also, there are many different fields. So we have computational perception, which is one of my areas of expertise. So how we can uh, automatically analyze videos and speech and audio and images. And I think Seth might show one example later. Uh, we have machine learning, which is uh, another of the very important areas and another of my areas of expertise. We have reinforcement learning, robotics, learning under uncertainty, effective computing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to understand that AI is very diverse because many times people associate AI with robots or AI with something that they've heard of called deep learning, but they don't really know exactly what that is. So I think it's important to understand that it's a massive field. So why are we talking so much about AI today? So there has been an incredible um, a sort of like rate of progress in the past six to eight years in the bottom-up approach to AI because of three important factors. The massive amount of data, availability of massive amounts of data, as called big data, I'm sure you've heard of it. The availability of computer, computing power at a very cheap rate because mainly of Moore's law and the development of a specific hardware for training complex AI systems. And the availability of um, an evolution of the original neural network, which is showing performances that we could have never imagined, you know, 10 years ago. So today, um, most of the progress in AI is due to the progress in this area called deep learning, which is inside machine learning, which is inside artificial intelligence. So what does deep learning mean? So deep learning is an evolution of the original neural network, which was proposed back in the 50s. This is a very simple representation of the original proposal of the perceptron, which tries to computationally model how a neural network will work. So you will have some input data, which represents the amount of activity of the adjacent neurons. Then you have some weights, and then this is, will be a neuron, and then the output is sort of like how um, uh, intense, sort of like what this neuron decides to do, whether it is uh, activated or not activated. So this very simple model, which was inspired by biological neurons, has evolved into things like this, which is basically the same idea, but you have many, many more neurons in between creating what is called a deep neural network because it has a lot of layers in between. Just to give you an idea, instead of there are systems that perform better than humans in speech recognition or in image recognition, um, could have uh, hundreds of layers and uh, um, uh, billion, uh, US billions of parameters, so thousands of millions of parameters. Um, so because um, of a few characteristics of AI, which I'll tell you later, it has been um, said that it has the ability to profoundly transform all societal sectors. And Andrew Ang, one of, a friend of mine that I met when I was at MIT, now he's a professor at Stanford, has sort of like parallel AI to the role that electricity played in the second industrial revolution. Why? Because AI is transversal, is invisible, and is ubiquitous. What does it mean that it's transversal? It means that we can use it in any field. 
We can use AI in biology, in finance, in medicine, in education, in logistics, in e-commerce, in transportation. Basically, every field of society is going to be enriched and transformed by AI. Why do I say that it's invisible? Because it's not robots. The vast majority of AI is software. You all have AI in your phones. If you pull out your phone and you're gonna take a picture now and the phone shows you a rectangle with my face, how does the phone know where my face is? There isn't a gnome inside the phone telling the phone where the face is, that's an AI system. If you can talk to your phone, that's an AI system. If you use Facebook or Google or any, any um, sort of like service today, they are all full of AI systems. AI is also scalable and updatable. And those two characteristics are also very powerful. It is scalable because it's software, so you can very easily deploy it in the entire planet. It is complex. I show you an example of a neural network, and I maybe said we'll show later another one. It is very complex. It's difficult to interpret it many times, but it also enables us to deal with complexity because we are completely unable to make sense of the massive amounts of data that we have today without the use of AI models. So it is complex, but it also enables us to um, deal with comple complexity. And it is updatable because it's software. So it creates scenarios that were unthinkable in any other time of our history. For example, if I have an AI system that is able to diagnose a certain, say, cancer in some uh, X-rays, say, images, Conceivably, if, uh, if one researcher, you know, a group of researchers in AI develop a new method that is way better than the best human and is way better than any system, you could very easily deploy this latest technology in all the hospitals in the world. So instantaneously, you could actually have the latest medical knowledge in the world. The analog parallel, which would be that all the doctors in the world learn about the latest you know, advances in medicine is completely unthinkable. AI also has, like machine learning mainly, models have the ability to predict. And this is also very new in our history. We can use these models to predict the future, uh, which has a lot of applications in many fields. But it also has two not so positive uh, characteristics. First of all, we have a situation of asymmetry. Asymmetry on who has access to the data necessary to train the systems, and asymmetry in who has access to the knowledge to be able to actually leverage this. And this is a very, very uh, big challenge that we need to overcome. And the second challenge, and I think Seth might show an example here, is that we have today the ability to generate synthetic content, videos, audio, images, text, that is completely indistinguishable to real content by any human. And this is this combined with the ability to spread fake content, you know, massively, is really changing the formation of public opinion and is really changing communication and is giving a lot of power to the people who can do this. So those two challenges, I think, are important challenges that we, we cannot obviate and that we need to take into account. So with all these characteristics, so AI is having massive impact, and I'm sure you know because you probably are many of you economists. So this is just by a statista. This year, uh, the global market of AI is gonna uh, be bigger than 4,000 million US dollars, so four US billion dollars. Uh, this is a prediction uh, by Price Waterhouse Cooper on the global impact of AI, and by 2030, it will be in the trillions, US trillions of dollars, both because we're gonna increase our productivity, but also because there will be uh, time saving, which is also related to productivity, and also higher demand of services and systems that are using AI. If we look at the estimated impact in GDP, um, the impact can be as high as 2%. So countries who will be able to leverage AI in a positive way could grow your, their GDP by up to 2%. And if we look at Spain, the estimation is 0.8%. So it, it does have tremendous uh, economic potential. And of course, it is transforming the labor market, and you guys know this better than me, so I'll go quickly on this. So the OCDE estimates that 12% of the jobs in Spain will be automated or will be directly impacted by AI. But at the same time, this has always happened, maybe not with this scale, but it's always happened that technological progress has transformed the labor market. And there are many jobs that existed when my grandma was small that don't exist today. Like, I don't know, these ladies that put the phones, you know, or the guy that opened the doors for you, <laughs> like in your house and stuff like that. And there are many jobs today that didn't exist 10 years ago. Like, 
mobile app programmer because there were no smartphones, so there were obviously no mobile app programmer, right? Or all the social media related jobs or data scientists, you know, etc. So this, this study by McKinsey found that a third of the new jobs in the US are actually in new areas, most of them related to technology. So there is a massive amount of job creation in the technological area. In fact, the World Economic Forum estimates that there will be a net creation of 58 million jobs by 2021 due to AI. And in the European Union, and the European Commission is actually very worried about this, there is going to be a demand of 900,000 technology jobs that we actually cannot fulfill because we don't have enough people studying this area. And if we look at Spain, the PISA report from 2017 estimates that almost half of like the most demanded professions in Spain are related to engineering and technology. So there's going to be a massive transformation in the types of jobs that are going to be demanded a lot of them are going to be related to technology. I think this is very important because it's related to the retirement and the pensions area. And I don't think we are prepared. I don't think we are preparing ourselves as a society to actually be able to do all these new jobs that are going to appear. So what happens as a society? So you guys don't know this. We're getting really old. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, this is actually from yesterday. Spain has the lowest natality rate in the last 40 years. So not only we're living longer, but we also are not having any kids. So you know it's getting really bad. So if we look at Spain, um, this is the we have a negative growth in the amount of people. And this is the pyramid, which is not a pyramid, as you can see, it's more like a, like a diamond, uh, a population pyramid of Spain, which is really like getting bigger and bigger with the old ages, and there's almost no children anymore. So we cannot obviate this. You know, This is happening, and it's already happening. So we, we cannot change it, I don't think, uh, because we're not going to start not living longer. And I guess we could try having more kids, but maybe we don't fit in the planet anymore, and we have to go somewhere <laughs> else. So uh, maybe it's a good thing that we're actually not growing. But we also live in a digital world. I mean, this is amazing. The two biggest countries in the world are Facebook and WhatsApp. They're bigger than China and India. And China and India exist for like, you know, thousands of years. And those two countries are owned by the same company, which actually exists only for 15 years. So this is amazing. I mean, if you, if you think about it, the power that this company has, like in the world, uh, and not only that, like the fifth country is Instagram, which is also owned by the same company. So basically, yeah, there's one company that is accumulating more power than the most powerful countries in the world. And we cannot obviate this. And this is leading to a world of inequality. So inequality exists when there is the concept of property. So if there is no concept of property, it's difficult to have inequality because property is as associated with ownership. So in the agrarian revolution, land was the thing to own. And the people who own the land were the rich people. With the Industrial Revolution, the factories and the machines are the thing to own. And with today's revolution, we could argue that it's data and the ability to make sense of the data that is actually the thing that is making people rich. And the problem is because data is intangible. It's distributed. You can replicate it thousands, infinite times at zero cost. It's creating these massive inequalities because whoever owns this data and the ability to make sense of it can accumulate a massive amount of power in, in a very fast, you know, a very small amount of time. Such a, in such a way that the richest 1% of the planet owns half of the world's wealth, and the richest 100 people in the world own more than the bottom 4,000 uh, million people in the world. This is incredible, I think. And many people can argue, but we can, I would say that in part is due to technology and to the for industrial revolution. In such a way that AI has become a political issue, and it has to be a political issue. Because if we want to fight inequality, it has to become a government issue. I think the role of the government should be to try to foster you know, more equality in their societies. So this is just how many times AI has been mentioned in the UK Parliament and the, in the US Congress since the 90s. And you say they had no idea that this thing existed, basically, until very recently, when it suddenly has become this really fashionable topic. And I think this is good. But we need to make sure that we're educating politicians so they're actually making the right decisions. So most countries are creating their national strategies on AI because it has become a very important issue. So let's move on. So individual, I'll go very quickly. So why do, why do we work? So I think we work because we have to, because otherwise we wouldn't have enough food you know, to, to survive. So I think there's a livelihood con component. But there are many other reasons why people work. We work because it gives meaning to our lives, because it enables us to engage socially. You see your coworkers. You can actually you know, talk to other people. 
It helps us develop, it helps us learn, it helps us be stimulated intellectually and socially. It, sometimes it enables us to fulfill our passions, like in my case, my job is my passion. And it helps us to give back to society. So there are many reasons why we work. And then why do we retire? Well, sometimes it's because we cannot continue working because we are physically or mentally, we have declined. But there are other reasons also why people uh, retire. Sometimes it's because people have to retire, even if they don't want to. And sometimes it's because they can't, you know, because they want to actually have leisure time and do some other things with their lives. But expectations have changed. When we created this whole system of working and retiring, which was like in the first industrial revolution or, or, or you know, in the middle, in the 20th century, the main reason why people work was to have a livelihood. But if you ask people today why they work, most people would say to find meaning in their lives and for personal development, like a, like a study just recently did with young people in the US. So I think our work model is obsolete. I think there's a massive demand for technology-related jobs that we are not really fulfilling. I think that this idea of one professional career over a lifetime is over. We should all think that we're going to have multiple careers in our lives. I mean, if you're going to live to 100, it would be kind of uh, boring you think that you're going to have only one career. But also, technology is moving so, so quickly that you have to be learning constantly. And this is a very important change. And I think we also need to think of, like, Working as a very flexible thing. You can work part time, you can work from home, you can freelance. So there's all this, for example, I don't work where I live. And I think most people should do this. You should be able to decouple where you work from where you live. And I think our retirement modeling is very obsolete. We're using a model from the second industrial revolution and we are in the fourth industrial revolution. So we are in a world that is highly technological, that is digital, that is global with high life expectancy and with high expectations about work. And we have a retirement model, which is from the 19th century. So if we think in the 50s, you know, the retirement model was you retire when you're going to die, basically, because your life expectancy was around the time when you retire. But today, you retire, and then you have like 30 years of your life that you don't know what to do with those years. And psychologically, it's not easy for many people as well. So I think we need a new model. So I'm just going to give you some ideas, which uh, uh, probably you think uh, you might think you know that this woman is crazy, but okay, I'll give you some ideas. So I think this excess of productivity on AI that I told you about, this growth in GDP, those trillions of dollars that are going to be being generated, if we're able to do the right thing and, and diminish inequality, we should be able to have some kind of universal basic income. So we can provide all basic necessities to everyone, not even just to the people who retire, because I don't think there should be this concept of retirement in the first place. I think we need to change our educational system and our government policies. And it, I think we need to promote equality, promote innovation, and develop the intellectual and the emotional skills, which I'll be happy to talk about later, to be able to actually live in a world where we are synergistically working with technology. And I don't think retirement should be binary. And I don't think it should be compulsory. I think it should be something flexible. Maybe I want to you know, work part-time when my kids are small. And then maybe work really hard when my kids are older, you know, and maybe I'm not able to do that right now. Or with technology, you can actually work for a long time because there's no physical work. It's, it's, uh, a lot of it is computer-related work. So it really enables you to age, you know, with your job much better than in the old-fashioned model of working in a factory, which I can see that by the age of 40, you were totally burnt out, you know, for, from such a job. So just to finish, um, I like this quote by Stephen Hawking, you know, AI could be the best of, or the worst thing that has happened to humanity, and what I work on is that it is the best thing that has happened to us, and I can wait for tomorrow, so that's my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nuria. Uh, that, was, that was great, and uh, the, 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 the bull is set for the next step, so that uh, uh, I think that uh, Professor Benzel. Uh, so while they set up presentation mode, I want to thank Nuria for an absolutely fantastic presentation. Really interesting stuff, um, especially on how AI works. And um, I'm going to try to spend a little bit less time talking about the technology, because there's no way I can keep up with her expertise about, expertise about the technology, but think a little bit more about how these technologies are going to affect things like fantastic labor markets, okay, uh, and the macro economy in general. Um, so I'm Seth Benzel. I'm a postdoc at MIT, like uh, uh, I was introduced as, which is good. <laughs> um, okay. So 
in order to talk about where we think that the technology is going to go in the future and how that's going to affect the macro economy, I want to spend some time first talking about how do we think the economy across the developed world has changed over the last 30 or so years with the last round of technological change to see maybe we can say something about the future extrapolating out from current trends. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about those emerging technologies and how they might be different from or contribute to these trends, and finally talk a little bit about pensions and policy. Okay, so when thinking about how technology, and in particular automation technologies and digital technologies, have changed the developed world and their economy over the last 30 or so years, I want to focus on three big trends. The first is a decrease in labor share of income. The second is something called employment polarization. And the third is superstar economics for firms and workers. And I think there's strong evidence tying all three of these trends to new technologies. So the first of the these is a decrease in labor share of income. So uh, for those of you who are not economists, uh, one way of you know, slicing up all of the money that's made in the economy is you can take all of the money that's made by workers in terms in form of wages and divide that by GDP. And so that would be called labor's share of income. Historically, labor's share of income had been really steady across uh, many countries at right around two-thirds of national income. In kind of famously, it was one of the macroeconomic facts that macroeconomists always tried to incorporate into their models was a stable labor share of national income. But what we've seen over the last 30 or so years is decreases in labor share of income across many developed uh, countries. Uh, first famously documented by Kara Barbunas and Neiman in their paper. And to give you a sense of how big this change is, in Spain, the decrease has been from around 68% of national income being paid to workers to around 60% being paid to workers. Uh, there's significant evidence tying these changes two technological changes. So for example, Asimoglu and Restrepo have a paper that shows when a region is more exposed to industrial robots, that region's output goes up and its wages and employment go down, right? So that's an example of how these technologies can be lowering labor share of income. Who is going to make that money instead? People who own businesses, people who own capital. Mm -hmm. Okay. The second fact I want to point us towards is employment polarization. So employment polarization is the idea that think about dividing up jobs from the lowest skilled third, to, excuse me, the lowest paid third, the middle paid third of occupations, and the highest paid third of occupations. Over the same interval of time, we've seen a decrease in the employment and wages of those middle wage jobs and an increase in the employment and wages of low-paid jobs and high-paid jobs. In Spain is actually kind of almost an exception here. You've seen about a 12% decrease in your employment in middle-wage jobs over the interval 93 to 2010, with almost no growth in the low-wage jobs that a country like US has had to absorb some of those people losing middle wage jobs. But again, you can see kind of the pattern here across these OECD countries is that polarization. How do you tie that to technological change? Uh, this famous paper by Autor and Dorn, which looks at different regions of the United States and points out that these middle wage jobs tend to be routine jobs, right? They could be kind of, um, you know, paper pushing desk work, office work that can be automated, or they can be uh, you know, factory line work where you can automate that with a physical robot rather than some sort of automated uh, business process. They look at parts of the U.S. that are more and less exposed to that and they show, hey look, in the regions that were more exposed to these, uh, being vulnerable to these routine job automating technologies, you see a bigger decrease in these middle wage jobs, bigger importing of new technologies like ICT technologies and more growth at the top and the bottom end of the employment distribution. Now, I talked before about kind of polarization across, you know, looking across all different sorts of workers, but not only has there been increasing inequality 
within you know, the broad spectrum of workers, there has been increasing inequality within top workers. So what these figures here show are the share of, the share of income, of, lab, of wages, being paid to people at different percentiles of labor income. This is in the United States uh, from the interval 1960 to 2010. And you can see in the top figure, uh, yeah, I think it's clear, in the top figure, you can see people in the bottom 75% of the labor distribution have been getting a reducing share of all of the wages that are being paid. People in the top 25% have seen their share of wages go up from about 55% in 1960 to about 70% today. Now, what's interesting there is that that change isn't driven by everyone in the top 25% of labor earners making more. Rather, if you now go to the figure below that and look at just the top 10% of labor earners, most of that change is being driven by the top 2.5%. So you can see people from the, bottom t from the top 10% to the top 2.5% have seen their share of wages go up a little bit. The top 2.5% have seen their share of wages go up from about 12% of national income to over 20% of national income. They've seen their share of the raw wage bill almost double. And I can keep on going deeper and deeper if I had more time. And you can see this fractal pattern continues as you look within the 1%, as you look within the 0.1%, mm -hmm. that the increasing share of the growth in wages that are going to high work earners are concentrated within the richest of the rich. So it's not only that, like I showed you before, high-skilled workers are making more and middle-skilled workers are making less. It's that the very high-skilled workers are pulling away from the high-skilled workers, and the very, very rich are pulling away from the rich, and the extraordinarily stupidly rich are pulling away from the very, very rich. Why do I think that this can be tied to technologies, too? Well, so. One way to think about it is uh, there's a paper by Rosen called The Economics of Superstars that came out in uh, 1980 that suggests that digital technologies might lead to these sorts of winner-take-all markets, mm -hmm. both in labor and for firms. The example that the metaphor that he uses in that paper is one of music, right? So you can imagine back in the day before recording technologies, if we wanted to have a band at our party and listen to some music at our party, <clears throat> each of our party has to go. Each party has to go and hire its own band, right? So I hire a band, you hire a band, etc. But with digital technologies, we can all go onto YouTube. We can all watch, uh, you know, the most popular singer. Um, and now, instead of the money that's being paid for the task of singing going to lots and lots of different bands, it's all going to one band, the famous singer and one um, you know, streaming service, YouTube, right? Which is a Google company, as I'm sure you all know. So I think there's a lot, to, there's a lot of reasons to, and you, can, you look at industries that are more affected by ICTs, and you see that the wage growth for leadership positions in ICT um, industries has grown up more than in other industries. So there, I think there's a lot of suggestive evidence that this trend, too, is driven by technological changes. Not only do we see superstars within workers, we see superstars within firms. So there has been some documentation of the fact that the profit share, the amount of profits that companies are making are going up, and that's not being driven by all companies becoming more profitable. It's driven by a small handful of companies becoming extraordinarily profitable. So in, analogous, in an analogous way to we were talking about workers and you just have one band satisfies for everyone because of a winner-take-all market, you can imagine over the last 30 years we went from a lot of small stores to those all being replaced by a Walmart or an Amazon that can make really, really large profits in this, uh, because of technologically enabled increasing returns to scale. Okay, hope everyone can hear me. Um, we can see this show up in terms of these firms that have sort of these really weird behaviors or characteristics compared to the leading firms of the past. So I call this the inverted firm of you have these firms that are extraordinarily valuable but have very few employees 
and have very few, cap very few um, capital that they personally own. So you look at Uber versus BMW. Both fulfill the task of providing you with the service of getting you from point A to B point B. BMW had 100,000 employees in 1916, market cap of 50, or excuse me, it was founded in 1916. Recently had 116,000 employees, market cap of 55 billion, giant factories that they own. Uber doesn't own any factories, doesn't own any cars, has very few employees. Most of the people who drive Uber are contractors, not employees, and is worth more than BMW, has been valued as more than BMW. Similarly for Airbnb versus Marriott. Airbnb doesn't own hotels, although I just saw something in the news that they, maybe they're going to set mm -hmm. up a boutique hotel mm -hmm. or two. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting kind of uh, phenomenon of firms starting off in the platform space and now moving back into the traditional pipeline business. But that's <laughs> follow-up question. I can just speak louder. Is, th is this better? Uh, okay. Oh, excuse me. Okay. All right. Hopefully the translators are happy. Um, okay, cool. All right. Um, all right, so that's where we've be gone over the last 30 or so years. So where are we going now? So I want to talk about the potential of AI and machine learning, um, give an example of an area where machine learning is doing very well, which is image recognition. And again, Nuria knows way, way more about this than me. The projects that she has done are way more impressive. And I'm just going to show you a demonstration of how even someone who has no computer science expertise like me can start to use some of these tools. Um, and then think about how, are, how is work changing kind of in a boots on the ground sense because of these technologies. So first, you know, you've seen a lot of slides. People are spending more on um, AI in terms of VCs. That's one of the dimensions. Um, Nuria talked a little bit about these different concepts of artificial intelligence, which is the general concept, machine learning being instanti. I think she actually, you actually should have figured that was very similar to this figure. So, um, but so then what I'll focus on here is just the idea of from an economic perspective, why is machine learning and these sort of scruffy approaches to AI so much more powerful than you know, good old fashioned AI and these expert systems? And the answer is um, written by an old economist, a man by Polian called Polanyi, Polanyi, who had Polanyi's paradox. And Polanyi's paradox was there's lots of stuff we know how to do but we can't explain to someone else how to do it. So the example he used was juggling. You know, once you know how to juggle, you know how to juggle, but I can't just tell you how to juggle and then you know how to juggle. You have to kind of, you can't set up an expert system, say, follow this set of steps and then you will juggle. And if you think about all of the jobs that humans do, most of them are based on this sort of implicit knowledge rather than on this expert knowledge that you can write out step by step. Um, these technologies are becoming more diffused and uh, organizations like Fast AI, Kaggle, and AutoML are making these AI tools and these AI technologies much more available for all sorts of firms. It's not just Google that's going to have access to these technologies. One angle that we've seen a lot of progress on is in image detection and recognition, uh, where currently uh, best AI systems are starting to beat humans at their ability to, rec to look at an image and say, this image contains this object. Um, if you're interested, I'll make a brief aside here. Uh, if you're interested in measures of how AI is developing, the a Stanford has an AI index, which is tracking um, a lot of uh, the progress of AI along a lot of different dimensions. Their annual report just came out this morning. I was hoping to get some of that slides in here today, but definitely check out the Stanford AI Index for progress. How many jobs are mostly image categorization? Well, a lot of them have a little bit of that. Just as an example of how someone like me, who's not a computer scientist, can use these AI technologies, I followed Fast AI's tutorial and I build an image recognition system that was able to separate images of San Fermines versus images of Tomatina. <laughs> and so you can see, uh, my, my, I had a research assistant put together 800 images of both, or of both. You see three images on the top, those were the images that the AI system was most confident with San Fermines. 
And then the three images we were most con confident were Tomatina. And um, again, just following a tutorial, doing nothing fancy myself, I was able to build an image recognition system that was able to get um, 248 out of 251 test images correct, correctly sorted into this is a Tomatina image versus this is a San Fermines issue, I image. Okay, so now thinking about these new machine learning techniques and how are they going to change jobs. So one way of thinking about um, sorts of tasks that machine learning systems are going to be good at is, is this task involving taking a standardized input, making a decision about it, and giving you a standardized output? So image recognition is an example of this task because, you know, the standardized input is a picture. The decision you have to make about it is, is this a dog, is this San Fermines? Um, and it's all very Stanford, standardized and can be taught in a supervised machine learning way. And so some colleagues of mine, Brynjolfsson, Mitchell, and Rock, went and for all nine, for 964 jobs, classified each job, broke it into tasks, and asked each of these you know, 10 tasks done in each of these 964 jobs, what percentage of those tasks do we think could be machine learnable and you know how easily so there's some good news and some bad news there the good news is is that almost no job is entirely composed of tasks that are completely machine learnable the bad news is that there are very few tasks that don't have some element that are machine learnable uh, just to give you an example of a task that, an occupation which is very machine learnable, credit authorizers. So if you say, hey, bank, I want to make a loan. That decision-making process, you can see how that sounds a lot like the image recognition process. Whereas on the other hand, massage therapy, where, you know, there's no clear input, no clear output, a lot of hands-on work. It's an example of something that machine learning is not particularly good at. So... Because we have this, par not a paradox, this tension, which is that so many jobs have some element which is automatable, or is going to be automatable in the near future, and yet no jobs are completely automatable, that suggests what people have been talking about, which is that the jobs themselves are going to have to be redesigned more than eliminated. Um, so just to give an example of job reorganization, um, people talk about like last mile delivery. So suppose if we want to automate the process of Amazon getting a package to your door, a lot of those steps might become automatable. The step of locating the box in the factory, getting the box in the factory onto the truck, getting the truck to your door, these are all automatable steps or are going to be automatable in the near future. But that very last step of now the truck's outside your door, somebody's got to pick up the box, ring your doorbell, get you to sign something, that's a much harder lift than all those three previous steps. And if you think about it, if you don't solve that last step, you actually haven't automated all that much because the guy's still got to sit in the truck that whole time, even if the cuts of truck's a driverless truck. So I think that is an example of how the challenge is now going to be, how do we separate the automatable part of the job from the non-automatable part of the job? And an example like that, it's not obvious. It's not obvious that you can get the gains from the automatable part. Why should we think that these new technologies are going to be really powerful? I'll give you a metaphor here. I don't know how much I buy it myself, but maybe you guys will be persuaded. Um, there was an event um, in the early history of, of the Earth called the Cambrian Explosion where um, we went from some pretty simple multi, you know, single and multi-celled organisms in the ocean to this vast explosion of different sorts of life. Um, it's sort of a discrete point in time where there's this big jump. And some scientists think that that big jump that occurred occurred because of the development of the eye. And that once the eye was developed, this created opportunities for much, much more varied forms of life to emerge. And if we think that machine learning has become really good at image recognition, well, perhaps we are on the verge of a sort of technological Cambrian explosion. Um, next, I want to talk about some, so a limitation of AI is that 
especially with supervised learning, there's very little ability to reason outside of context. So in a supervised learning setting, you're giving the computer, here's an example. Um, this is how you should classify the example. And the computer's trying to copy you in sorting things, which is kind of a limitation for outside of context. Um, and these prediction models are predictive. They're not causal models. So sometimes in science, we don't really care so much about predicting what's going to happen tomorrow. We care about what causes something to happen tomorrow, which is a different sort of question that AI isn't very good at yet. And then finally, AI creativity. Is AI creative? Probably not right now. But you can get uh, AI to do some pretty uh, interesting things. So this is one of the San Fermines images. And when we throw it through Deep Dream Generator, which is a neural net that kind of puts onto the image things that the computer thinks are sort of look like it's there, you can turn this San Fermines image to a sort of a dreamscape of dogs and bucket men, etc. Okay, so now for a minute about uh, pensions and policy. So intergenerational impact of automation. Automation and interest rates. The second one is a riddle that I've been really kind of struggling with. And actually, we've been talking about this a little bit. Um, and how thinking about to tax the robots and how are we going to get some money for these pensions? OK. So first, uh, you know, here's my meme. Robot can't take your job if you're already retired. So that's the smart move. Um, and in terms of, so in terms of intergenerational impact, uh, we should recognize that this is a challenge mostly for young people. If you're about to retire or you're on the verge of retirement, you've, kind, you've lucked out. You've dodged this bullet um, in, in two senses. The first sense is you've spent less of your time on the labor market exposed to the technology. The second is, well, pensions are still funded now. In the future, we have some challenges. And actually, I'm going to give you a third reason, which is there's some emerging evidence, uh, again, a different paper by Asimoglu and Restrepo, which has looked at uh, regions that have adopted machines, and they found uh, industrial robots in particular, and have found that older workers tend to be more complemented by the industrial machines, whereas younger workers are the ones who are more likely to be laid off. Why that is, there's some question. What they speculate is if you're a a factory worker who's been with the company for a very long time, you have all this institutional knowledge about how the factory works. You probably have more of a management job or more of a soft skills job, a sales job. And those are jobs that are less likely to be eliminated by these robots. Whereas if you're just starting at the factory, you're doing kind of the most basic work, the kind of stuff that the industrial robot is going to really be competing with you along. The second thing, and this is a kind of an open question or a riddle, um, is thinking about secular stagnation in the context of automation. So secular stagnation is something people started talking a lot about in the wake of the Great Recession, which is the idea that the economy is just kind of growing a lot slower than we'd like it to. And um, interest rates are low, people aren't investing, and just overall product you know, growth is just not at the level we'd want it to be. That's sort of surprising given this conversation we've just been having about how exciting and dynamic all these new technologies are, right? So if all these technologies are so exciting and dynamic, and they're so exciting and dynamic that they can have these massive macroeconomic implications, like reductions in labor share of income, why don't we see faster growth? Why don't we see... Uh, more investment, why don't we see higher interest rates? And the argument in particular for higher interest rates is, if I'm a, fact if I'm a factory and you can tell me I can buy an automated si or a, a business and I can buy some sort of automated system and lay off some of my workers such that my labor share goes down, well, this should be attractive to all these different businesses. They should be bashing down the doors of Santander saying, give me loans, I want to buy these new technologies. And yet we don't see that. And yet interest rates are kind of at, all, are at really 30-year lows. This figure here is just four different measures of the US real rate of return. The, uh, kind of the idea of if you were a business and you were trying to think about, should I invest in a technology or not, you should think about, well, if the interest rate's high, I need a high rate of return. If the interest rate's low, I only need a low rate of return. Interest rates are very low. I, you know, That's a challenge for, I'm sure, people 
investing in pensions, but it's a riddle for us macroeconomists who are trying to who are thinking that these technologies should boost demand for machines and technologies. So why is that? Um, I have a paper that tries to think through this riddle, and what we think is that it has to do with these superstars, firms, and workers as being the ones who are the only ones who have the ability right now to implement these new technologies. And if only a couple of people have the ability to implement these two technologies, first, they're going to get an increasing share of national income, like we've seen. And the second is, we're going to see less growth in wages for ordinary people and returns to ordinary capital, aka, AKA the interest rate, because you know, it's not this broad-based boom in productivity. It's only a particular set of companies and workers who can take advantage of them. And so that's a question going <laughs> forward, which is, is it temporary? Yeah. Is it is this a temporary thing that, um, you know, only some people can take advantage of these technologies, and therefore interest rates and wages for normal occupations will remain low? Or is this a long-term phenomenon that we're going to have to worry about, which is because of perhaps winner-take-all effects, it's just going to be the case moving forward that ordinary labor, ordinary capital are not going to get high rates of return, and rather the people making the money are going to be an increasingly small share of the population. Okay, so what should we do about this? Well, I'll make a couple of points here. The first is, of course, it is a goal of all of us. I, I think it's a goal of all of us. It's certainly a goal of me, and based on Nuria's presentation, her, to reduce uh, inequality. We want everyone to benefit from economic growth, everyone to benefit from technological change. The question then is, how do we make sure that the gains are broad-based? So that's sort of challenge number one is broadly the distributional challenge of these new technologies. How do we make sure the kinds of people we want making the money make the money or the money is split more evenly? On the other side, there are sorts of all these other challenges. So Nuria talked about Nick Bostrom, superintelligence. He's not worried about inequality going up. He is you know, worried about killer robots getting out of control and killing everybody, which is another sort of challenge that is maybe a more distant challenge, but another, you can see how that's a challenge that's a different challenge than just a distributional question. So some people have proposed for dealing with these problems, both the distributional problem and the problem which is we might not like a world with all of these advanced technologies, either because the technologies don't like us <laughs> or because they will kind of kill something that's essential about the human experience. Um, I'll, or because we won't, yeah, there, or something essential about the human experience, and I'll kind of introduce sort of a third related idea. So on the first question, which is how do we reduce inequality that's been increasing, I think I've made the case because of technology in part. Well, um, there have been some papers that come out that I find persuasive which argue that taxing automation or taxing trade is probably not the best way of solving this problem, right? And just the economic intuition for this is you always want to produce output in the most efficient way possible. If you're taxing a robot or you're taxing an AI system, you're saying to people, don't work in the most efficient way possible, work in this more old school way. Now that might have distrib positive distributional consequences, right? So if it is the case that robots and AI are lowering the labor share, then if you prevent robots from coming in, you can raise the labor share, and potentially some workers will have higher labor income. But it's generally the position of these papers that the more efficient way of getting more income to workers isn't through preventing the emergence of these new technologies or taxing them, but rather doing a standard broad-based tax, such as a VAT or a personal income tax or a wealth tax and then just using that money to disproportionately transfer to the people who are being left behind by these new technologies. And actually in Costineau and Verning, uh, they have a very interesting paper where they actually say, suppose you can't actually even do that. Suppose you can't even have a precisely targeted income tax where you want to distribute exactly in a precise way, um, would as a second best, the next best way of getting money to people who are being automated be to tax uh, machines. 
And they find, well, in this sort of kind of highly constructed scenario, you can sort of you can build an argument for a very small robot tax, but a, a pretty small one. And still, the better way is to use other mechanisms to redistribute money. Another challenge that we'll have moving forward, which isn't precisely a distributional challenge, is the idea that we might get structural unemployment as the demand for labor changes faster than the skills that workers are providing. Um, that can lead to an inefficient outcome because if you're a firm and you're saying, I want to hire workers with the new skills, but you know that everyone who is looking for a job has the old skills, it's going to be harder for you to find a worker who has the skills you need. So that's kind of like a matching friction where in times of rapid technological change, you could have this increased unemployment and that could be inefficient overall is another sort of weak argument for, part, for taxing robots in particular, but is an argument you might make. Um, and now I'll talk about two ideas in particular. So I'm a big Isaac Asimov fan. It's one of the ways I got really interested in new technologies and how they impact the technology e economy. Um, and Isaac Asimov has two books in his robot novels um, about two different futures of how humans interact with machines. The first is Caves of Steel, which is a future in which um, robots are so productive that they can do almost any job. But because aggregate saving of the economy is so low, there's very few robots and people have very little labor income, right? So the idea here is robots are great, but there's not enough national savings to have enough robots to provide abundance for everyone. That's a kind of an idea that we explore in a paper, uh, Benzel Kotlikoff Lagarda um, and Sachs, where one mechanism which is potentially at play is we think that most savings are for retirement. So if you lower labor share of income, you've got less young people saving for retirement. You've got more old people who are just consuming in their retirement. Gross national savings and investment may go down. That's another challenge the government may face. And in a sense, if you have a pay-as-you-go pension system, like we have in the United States, that's a transfer from the young to the old, right? We're taxing from the young and we're giving to the old. And that's kind of the exact opposite of what we need to be doing as automation hurts young workers, but doesn't so much hurt retirees. Kind of the opposite problem, and I don't have an explicit model for this, is in Asimov's sequel, The Naked Sun, there's a society where there's so, so many robots that humans don't even interact with each other. Every human lives on this vast palatial estate served by teams of robots, and they barely interact with any other humans. And, you know, unsurprisingly, the society is not portrayed very positively, right? So those are two sorts of opposite futures that are, again, not distributional problems, except in perhaps the first you might think of an intergeneral redistribution problem that future generations we need to get money to rather than generations today. But they're certainly not within generational distributional problems of, um, too many robots, too few robots, um, and uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. Uh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> it's rather difficult to handle this microphone, but uh, I think uh, we're learning to do it. Uh, this is an ability human beings have, and it's an ability that machines are also acquiring. So uh, I will take profit of a few things you said, especially important for me, just to offer them to you back in order to uh, you to discuss about them, yeah, among yourselves. And then, um, first of all, uh, social interactions, uh, social compacts, and finally pensions. I mean, you mentioned, um, Nuria, that uh, machines uh, and robots, software robots, uh, are learning fast about how to imitate social or human interactions, not only behavior, but also inter interactions. Um, these interactions lead to compacts, social compacts, and one of the most basic social compacts we have in society today, and for many ages we have had these compacts, are uh, pensions or money. How do we get um, into money, into pensions, into savings, into preparing for retirement, 
through these new technologies, through this uh, uh, artificial intelligence that we are about, you know, starting to use um, um, day after day. Uh, so that, that's one question. Will, 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 we, will we finally able? Uh, will we be able uh, finally to to learn? from um, these developments in machine learning, in artificial intelligence, in order to better understand what's going on in our lives, what's going on in preparing for retirement, preparing for new jobs, education, how um, I, I recall here the, the Polanyi uh, paradox you mentioned. I mean, we know a lot of things, we don't know how to explain them. Uh, we are able to imagine amazing things for the good and for the bad but we don't know why they come to our minds, why uh, finally are we able to produce the routines and the interactions that uh, uh, make them real. Uh, so in, in this realm, I would like you to, to discuss our, what each of you said before uh, in order to set the, sta the stage for, for uh, the discussion, the further discussion on, on pensions after the coffee. And then I will have an, another um, group of uh, questions for you before we end. Okay. So is the question if we can use uh, AI techniques to better understand uh, ourselves and, and better uh, plan for the future? Is that the question? Because I'm not sure I understood the, the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely, definitely, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, credit scoring as one of the most automatable. It is automated already. I mean, there are many things that are fully uh, automated. Algorithms are making loads of decisions about our lives, independently of whether we know it or not. Um, so definitely using um, data-driven machine learning techniques to better understand ourselves is, um, I think a great tool is one of the areas that I work on. Um, it's called computational social sciences, and it comes as the result of combining social sciences with computer science. And it's only thanks to the availability of human behavioral data on the one hand, and then machine learning techniques that are able to make sense of that human behavioral data that we can actually shed light on our own, on, on our own behaviors. So um, this combined with another area in computer science which I've also worked on, called persuasive computing, can uh, enable us to envision scenarios where we could have intelligent systems that are able to maybe nudge us or help us um, have more financially responsible you know, behaviors or help us uh, maybe save for the future and things like that. However, as I said, I think our retirement model is completely obsolete. So I, I, I don't think we have to have this idea of retiring for the future. I think this is completely obsolete. My 15-year-old son is convinced that he's going to live forever. So um, I, I really think we need to stop talking about this. Uh, as Seth said, for the people that are retired already, I guess this question is irrelevant because they're retired already. So we need to think it's more about the future. And I, I think um, this model of you work X years, first of all, the model of you study X years, which is like, say, 22 years. Then you amortize what you studied until you die. This is completely obsolete. And then the second thing that I think is obsolete is that you work until you're 60 and then you don't work anymore. I think this is also obsolete. That's my yeah. personal view. Yeah. So I don't know what you think. You're the <laughs> economist. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, so uh, Nuria, I, ex I agree with a l like most of what you said. Um, so I kind of dividing that up into three points. So the first question about how can we use machine learning techniques to do better social science? I couldn't agree more that these are super exciting new techniques. I've used some really basic, you know, um, unsupervised machine learning techniques myself, old ones like principal component analysis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you often learn things using these techniques you haven't seen before in ways that are creative. So just to, I mean, to give the example of principal component analysis, um, sometimes you're faced with this data set that has all of these different dimensions, right? Maybe it's a survey where you ask someone a hundred different questions. And you're faced with the challenge of, like, how do I think as a human about someone answering a hundred different questions? And so using machine learning, you can use these dimensionality reduction techniques and turn a hundred questions into, you know, three underlying factors that drive how people are answering those hundred different questions. And 
that's something that's not only sort of automating prediction, but is a complement to what human researchers can do. Because once we've extracted those underlying factors, now maybe we can start to make theories about them and try to understand what's driving these behaviors in a way that's not so, okay, so now maybe a critique of using machine learning for social science is sometimes you get these predictions and either A, it's not clear why you're making the predictions, so neural nets are sort of famously a little bit opaque in how they make their decisions. And I know there's some work being done to make neural nets less opaque. Um, and then secondly, prediction isn't causality. Just because I can predict something is going to happen doesn't mean that I understand why it's going to happen. You see this happen, come up a lot in, um, especially in America, in the talking about in the context of algorithmic bias, right? So I might have a model, it might be it's a credit score model, and it might turn out to be the fact that, um, you know, I predict that women are more likely to pay back loans than men. And you have that prediction, you have that statistical relationship, but it's unclear whether that relationship is driven by something you would can you know, why that's happening. Is it something fundamental? Is it just some sort, as have to do with how women versus men are socialized? You, there's all sorts, you don't answer the question of why the relationship is happening. So I think there's still a role in part for um, people using more traditional statistical techniques and doing things like experiments or finding natural experiments. So definitely I'm very excited about machine learning and AI in the context of social science, but I don't think it completely supplants traditional statistical approaches. No, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, I didn't say that. So I just, wanted, that. I just wanted to very quickly yeah. bring this acronym FADEN to the table because I think you've mixed a few things there. So in the context of algorithmic decision making, it doesn't matter if it is to understand people or if it is to just make some you know, decision that it has nothing to do with understanding people. There are five important areas of work that are active research areas and that we need to definitely consider if we want to make sure that the impact of AI is going to be, you know, positive on society. And you've talked about some of them. So the F, and this is in Spanish, sorry, because I, I just gave this talk in Spanish two days ago and I didn't have time to translate it. Usually my talks are all in English, but this one had to be in Spanish. Um, so the F comes from fairness, which you explained. So um, we are, so these data-driven models, um, so the, the aspiration is that through the use of uh, data-driven models, we can improve human decision making. We know, and here in Spain, we know really well that human decisions are actually not that good. You know, we are susceptible to corruption to cognitive biases, we are selfish, we have conflicts of interest. I mean, there's all sorts of problems with human you know, decisions. So the idea is, well, if we could use algorithms that are not susceptible to corruption and that are not, that don't have a brother or a sister, you know, that, so maybe you know, we'll make better decisions. So that's the, the goal. But in reaching that goal, we realize that there are a number of problems <laughs> with um, using algorithms as well. So the first one is that algorithms can actually discriminate. And you gave an example. If they are data driven, if you are using uh, biased data, then the algorithm it learns the bias or sometimes even amplifies the bias because it thinks that, for example, if there is a minority class, say women and a majority class, the algorithm might think that the minority class is noise. They might think, oh yeah, these women just move them because you know they they're not they don't fit the pattern of like the majority class. So they even amplify sometimes um, the the biases. So that's that's why it's very important that the people who work with this have to have to have the knowledge. Otherwise, there is also the risk of badly using <laughs> algorithms and and then you know um, making mistakes. The next area is the A, which we haven't talked about, but I think is very, very important. <laughs> Sorry, because I'm not using the thing, I'm using this, it has a delay. And the A is, is, is three, it has three points. The first one is autonomy. Autonomy is a basic principle in Western ethics. And autonomy means that humans should own their own decisions and their own actions. However, when we have an algorithm that can understand me better than my own self, I can leverage that knowledge to influence my behavior in a subliminal way. Am I actually making my own decisions? And I would claim that none of us today owns their own decisions. Every single decision we make, we don't own them. A lot of our decisions are totally influenced by the technology that we use. 
The, other, the A comes also for accountability and responsibility. So we need to understand who is accountable for the consequences of their decisions. And then the A also comes from augmenting intelligence with said measure on you know, how much we can automate jobs. So most of the jobs probably are not gonna be fully automated. So the vision is we work together with algorithms and AI systems that complement you know, what we do. So we kind of like augment you know, our own abilities. Then the T comes from transparency, which you alluded to. So trans a system is transparent if, if a non-expert person can actually look at it and understand it. So why are systems not transparent? So it could be to protect the IP of the creators of the system. So I made this super duper you know, uh, behavior modeling system and I patented it. I don't wanna share it with the world because it's my IP. It could be because the models are not interpretable. So as I mentioned and Seth mentioned, you know, these very complex deep neural network models with a billion parameters, how do you interpret a billion parameters? They are really not interpretable. So they are non-usable in some use cases where you need to be able to explain why the system is doing what it's doing. And then another issue with transparency, another reason why a system might not be transparent is because even if I explain it to you, if you don't understand what I'm saying, it doesn't matter how much I explain it to you, right? So there is a, a skills sort of like opacity. If people don't have the minimum amount of knowledge to understand what I'm saying, you know, I could just be speaking Martian, you know, because they don't really understand what I'm saying. And that's why investing in education is so important from so many different angles. The E comes from benevolence, and there I'm cheating a little bit because I'm <laughs> taking the E. <laughs> and benevolence means that, and I am really advocating for this, um, you know, not every innovation is progress, you know. So not because we can do it, we should do it. I think we should really try to have a sense of whether is this actually making the world a better place or not. Is this actually being good for us or not? We have to think, talk about sustainability. We didn't talk about it. But there are some outlooks like Android that estimate that 20% of the energy consumption in the world is due to the technology industry. 20%, I mean, and growing. So we don't need to think about the sustainability impact. Then diversity, we didn't talk about it, but in AI, gender diversity is like 10%. And then ethnic you know, diversity is also extremely low. So all of us are using systems that are designed by a very homogeneous, highly paid you know, group of people. What's the impact of that you know, on society? Then I talked about veracity, you know, I talked about deep, you know, like fakes and, and, and fake content. And then again, education. I think education is absolutely key. And then the last one is non-maleficence. So one thing is to try to do good. And then the other thing is like not to do bad, Don't right? Be uh, so yeah, so we need to make sure that we're not killing anyone, you know, in the process that, you know, the systems are secure. I mean, security is a massive, you know, uh, potential vulnerability. And of course, you know, Privacy, you know, and, and and human rights, you know, have to always be preserved. So sorry for this. Uh, no, that's long uh, <laughs> that's perfect. Actually, I find this uh, fat and acronym uh, that uh, perfectly suits uh, pensions oh, really? and retirement <laughs> solutions. <laughs> now, Benzel, uh, Seth. Uh, Seth, sorry. Uh, why this fury about basic income? Mm. I mean, why everybody from every ideological quarter are just ending up? in agreement about the need for this basic income? I think it's a great question. Um, I think it gets back to that point that I was making before, which is we think that these technologies are contributing to inequality, and we think that the way of solving that problem isn't to ban the new technologies, right? So now you've got to get, so now with those two riddles, you've got this problem, which is uh, you need to get money from the people who have the money to people who don't have the money. And you can't do that. We don't think we can do that through manipulating the market in some way. Or we think it would be inefficient to try to manipulate the market through discouraging use of technologies or through things like minimum wages or through things like restrictions on labor. Um, so once you've put those sorts of constraints on yourself, the answer kind of your, your possibility space of answers is pretty narrow, right? The possibility space, the narrow space is now either the government should just give money to the poor people or the government should buy things for the poor people, right? Mm -hmm. You know, goods and services, healthcare, whatever, education. Um, and sort of the economic um, bias is always to say, well, people will do better if you give them the resources and let them make the decisions themselves, right? Now maybe if AI gets so powerful, the AI can make a better decision than you can make for yourself. That's, we can talk perhaps even in certain contexts, we can think about that. But that's the argument, right? The argument is, um, 
these are the problems. We've kind of eliminated, we've pared down the space of solutions. This is the one the solution that's left. There's some debate about whether people should prefer something that looks more like um, a basic income, which everyone would be paid the same, whether it would be a means-tested mm -hmm. basic income. So we would say once you make up to X dollars, you don't mm -hmm. get the basic income anymore. That's kind of just like a very discrete version of a negative income tax. That's it. Right? That's it. I was going to ask you about negative. it. <laughs> there you yeah. go. That's, so, that's, the, that's it. So there you go. So a basic income, a so one way to think, a basic income mm -hmm. with an income cutoff is just like a negative income tax with this cliff on it, right? Mm -hmm. And generally in economics, we think these welfare cliffs are bad ideas, because welfare cliffs are bad ideas. Um, these welfare cliffs are bad ideas because people who are making money right around the yeah. area of that yeah. cliff are yeah. going to face sense. really weird yeah. incentives. And so the advantage, so that kind of rules out the idea, from my perspective, of a basic income mm -hmm. with a cutoff. Mm -hmm. You'd be better off with something like a negative yeah. income tax. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's a solution. There's a question of how generous it can be, should be or can be in the mid to long term. There's a question of whether we should roll other Social Security programs into the basic income. Should we think, um, and uh, those are all good questions for future research. But I, I think that the logic towards either a negative income tax or a basic income is pretty inescapable. Yeah. There's a slight variation on this that people have talked about, which is, um, in America, we have a program called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is, it's a very weirdly shaped negative income tax. So the way it works is, if you work zero hours a week, if you make no money, you get no money from this program, right? There, there is such a thing as wealth, very limited welfare in the United States for people who make no money at all. But the way the EITC works is, as you make anywhere between about $0 and about $15,000 a year, as you make more money, we actually, the benefit gets larger, right? Um, and then once you get up to around $20,000 a year, the benefit fades out again, and now you're back to, and eventually, you know, you start getting taxed again. So that would be sort of a variation on a negative income tax that would be really trying to encourage very low-skilled workers to get work. Because you see, the way this works is now if you're, if, you, if you're a very low-paid person, it actually is really important for you to go out and make money. Because not only are you making the money, you're getting a bonus for every dollar you make. I'm, um, there are sort of social questions and, you know, how do we want to build society questions about whether that sort of approach is a good idea. Um, we've talked, you know, Nuria talked before about how one of the main kind of things we want to get out of work is a sense of social purpose and a sense that you're contributing. And perhaps if we just give a basic income, you'll get a lot of sort of disaffected people who feel uninvested in society, and that could lead to negative social outcomes. Whereas an approach like the earned income tax credit is really trying to make sure everyone works a little bit so as they all have a sense of participation in society. Now, the disadvantages of a program like that are that now you're taking those people who are making, who have like the lowest of the low skills, who potentially have very strong personal disincentives to work, either because you know they have household members that they have to take care of, or for whatever reason work is particularly unpleasant for them. Maybe they have pains and they can work, but it's just extremely unpleasant. And you're saying to them, well, we could just give you the money, but because you know your work isn't that valuable, but we, we think it's important for you that you go out there and break your back. And there's something that I think is a little bit condescending about that pro approach. So, uh, like I say, there's these group of related um, approaches. I think of them, the negative income tax is the most straightforward. So I have a question. Does any of you know, because there's been a lot of experiments for the past couple of years on different towns using universal basic income in different countries in the world. Um, do you ha does anyone have any feedback on the experience on, like, uh, what are the they, conclusions? They haven't been uh, terrific. Oh, really? Oh. They haven't oh. been terrific. They are continuing some of these experiments. Some other countries are discontinuing them at all, and the, the, the jury is out. 
All right, yeah. but is there any le lessons learned? Like, is there anything interesting learned from like what to do if you were, like what not to do if you were going to do it from scratch? Or well, so I'll give you one example, which is in Mexico and uh, Brazil, they've they've experimented with something called conditional cash transfers, which are programs like so long as your kid is going to school, we'll give you a cash transfer. And one of the lessons learned is if you if you're transferring money to a low-income household, you're much better off transferring the money to the mother than the father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Not, yeah this is well known, I think, yeah. for years. So yeah. that's an example. Um, I think the Swedish, so the yeah. Sw the Swedes were yeah. Yeah, finished. Excuse me, thank you. We're experimenting, and they found they, there was a hope that if you gave this basic income, it would give people an opportunity to re-enter mm -hmm, the labor mm -hmm. market. And I think there was uh, some sort of disappointing results there that people didn't really re-enter the labor market at higher rates. Although I may be misremembering. Okay. Good. Uh, a final uh, short question for you. Uh, I tend to finish many of my public interventions, most recently, um, telling the same about the future of, of, of uh, jobs. The, the future jobs will be so funny and rewarding that no one will want to retire. And then <laughs> we, will, you agree with me? we will have to abolish pensions. <laughs> yes. So are we witnessing or envisioning or just imagining the end of retirement, the end well, of pensions? Well, that's what I said. Yeah, here yes, it I is. Saw, I know, Look, I know. Here I want you to ideas. go deeper into this uh, uh, provocative idea. It? So I, didn't, I never heard you say that, so we, we think alike, you know. Absolutely. Uh, um, as I said, I think we need to completely transform both the working model and the retirement model and the learning model, all the models. I think we need to change them radically. And the part that worries me is that I'm not sure, because this, this requires a massive transformation, societal transformation, and a massive commitment and investment from the part of the governments. And I, I don't know if the governments, at least in Spain, I really don't know if they are thinking along these lines. And I'm not, not. I don't think they, are, they have the knowledge. Um, I think in some of these areas, definitely in technology, uh, to, um, to understand, you know, I mean, of course no one knows what the future will be, but it would be nice some experimentation, you know, the same way that there were pilots with the UBI, you know, maybe some pilots on, you know, some of these ideas, because we didn't talk about this, but there is a, a medical cost on, of retirement on the mental health of the people. So actually there is this scale of the most stressful events in your life and retirement is at the, at the top, in the top 10 of the most stressful events in your life. Because it's a message that society is telling you, thank you very much, but now you're useless basically, right? And I think for a lot of the jobs, Again, in the old industrial revolution, where the job was like killing yourself in a factory, physical job, really tough work, being a miner. Yes, I mean, you can't physically possibly, you know, work in whatever, 16 hours a day, you know, I mean, that was completely inhumane. But if we are thinking of this new way of working, where, you know, it's flexible, you know, it's part-time, you know, it's more, I guess, you can, like, it's on the computer, you know, which is more friendly to our body, you know, and to our minds. This message of having this binary concept of now you're useful, useful or, or and now you're useless, I think this is so wrong in so many levels. And I can tell from my own parents. I mean, my parents, who are uh, in the educators, like teachers, it was, it was <laughs> horrible for them to retire. Horrible. From a, and they, were, and they, could com they could have, for example, mentor young people. They could have been helpers in the classroom, you know, because there's always lack of teachers, actually. So there are so many different things that could have been done that we are not doing. We have this wisdom. You were talking, you know, people prefer to keep older people because they have wisdom, because they have networks, because they've been there before, because they have knowledge that you, cannot, you, you acquire by living. You don't acquire in the university. So we are ignoring this massive amount of wisdom in our society. With, because we have this binary model, which I think is really obsolete. So that's my. Yo, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I'll say historically, pensions have been a really positive force, right? Uh, before, you know, the state pension system introduced in Prussia, and then Amer later the Americans introducing a pension system, there was vast, like, extreme poverty amongst the aged, amongst people yeah. who couldn't do these physical jobs. So pensions were a wonderful thing. But as we move to a society where, um, A, you know, a lot more work is not physical, yeah. 
And B, just a lot of these digital processes allow us to make the work more flexible. Yeah. We don't need everyone working exactly 40 yeah. hours a week. You know, with things like the gig economy, yeah. with apps, we can have people working as many hours a week as they want to, flexibly meeting what jobs they want to, choosing which tasks they want to accept and which tasks they don't want to accept. Mm -hmm. And I know in many countries there's a lot of concern about the gig economy, about these, you know, sometimes they're called zero-hour contracts yeah. because, you know, there's the sense that, well, the employer has all the power and, you know, there's no job stability. In the long run, the concern is less job stability, but people having power over how they want to work. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Uber drivers in the United States, they say number one thing they love working for Uber is they get to work exactly when and where they want to. And as we make more and more work like that, the incentive to take this bright line of I want to retire now and now work no more is going to make less and less sense. Yeah. Now, it is my true and real pleasure to uh, to moderate this, uh, this second uh, track of the conference with the first intervention by Professor Arun uh, Muralida. Let me tell you a little bit about the merits of uh, Professor uh, Muralida. Uh, he is uh, adjunct uh, professor of finance at the George Washington University, is co founder of Alpha Engine Global Investment Solutions of uh, M-Cube investment. M-Cube sounds technological, <laughs> isn't it? So it's, it's technology, definitely. Investments technologies, co-author and defender with uh, Nobel laureate, laureate um, Robert C. Merton of the um, pension bonds, surface, life, and other innovative, very innovative solutions uh, to handle longevity and the needs of longer lives. Um, he's, he has been also co-author with Nobel laureate uh, Franco Modigliani just ago of uh, some basic and seminal research on finance and retirement. And uh, we have the true and real pleasure to have him here today. Thank you very much, Professor Muralida, for having here, supporting our, our conference and uh, you will have the, the floor for around 40 minutes. Uh, at the end of your intervention, I will make a couple of questions and then open questions and answers. We'll leave them for the final track of the conference, if you don't mind. The floor is yours, Professor Muralida. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Hersey. Uh, I really owe you a big thank you to, first of all, inviting me, but it's also a great honor to be in front of such a distinguished uh, individual who has so much amazing knowledge about the Spanish pension system. Uh, also, thank you to Afi for this kind invitation, and especially to Pablo for all the help he gave me, and I apologize for, for all the trouble. As I said, it's a real honor to be here because uh, Spain has both a blessing and a curse that they have to deal with. A, a recent article in the magazine Lancet, which is a medical journal, has said that Spain is going to be the country, if, if not already is, the country in the whole world with the longest life expectancy of 85.8 years. It's a blessing because that means that your country has people who are healthy and happy and they're living long, so that's a good sign. But also with the decline in fertility, it's a curse because the question then is how do we finance people's pensions? Uh, about 17 years ago, as Professor Hersey mentioned, uh, Professor Franco Modigliana and I wrote a book about how social security systems around the world were going to be facing a big problem because of changing demographics, low productivity growth, and bad pension systems. And one of the chapters in our book was about Spain, where we quoted many of the seminal papers of Professor Hersey, and we had predicted that unless Spain makes some radical changes in 2020, there are going to be some serious problems with the pension system. Now, Spain has made some changes, for example, extending the retirement age, uh, you know, increasing the averaging period. But as Nuria and Seth mentioned earlier, what you're going to have is a changing paradigm of pensions, which is, in the old days, we were expecting the government or our companies to look after us in retirement. 
We're now moving to a much newer model, which is the individuals are being asked to take that responsibility. Now, normally that wouldn't be a bad thing, except that when they do studies about financial literacy, 60% of the people cannot even answer a basic question about compounding or inflation. So we're now asking these people who cannot even answer basic finance questions to start to look after their own pensions. So today what I thought I'll talk about in my presentation is the question that you've raised, which I think is a very, very futuristic question, which is, will robots pay the pensions? And I'm hoping that through my experiences, both on the technology side as well as on the quant finance side, as well as in the industry, I can share some ideas that maybe Afi can benefit from, but also maybe members in the audience. Uh, just very quickly, what I'll do is, um, oh, maybe I'll just go down that row. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. We need a robot to change the slides. <laughs> That's the problem. Humans are not good at this. He's uh, a doctor in the room. <laughs> and it's funny, I own a technology company and I cannot even change slides. Uh, ah, perfect. Thank you. Glasses. Okay, thank you. So just very quickly about my background, I first started at the World Bank uh, 25 years ago issuing World Bank bonds, and I had responsibility for issuing Spanish peseta bonds. So I do have some familiarity with the Spanish financial markets, but it's 25 years old, a little bit old. I then looked after the pension fund of the World Bank, so I actually managed the pension assets, and I made many interesting mistakes, which I'll talk to you about today which I think I still see many pension funds around the world making those same mistakes. I then left, I went and worked for asset management companies like JP Morgan and some hedge funds, and I started my own company because I believed 16 years ago that technology was going to be absolutely critical to the management of pensions. So I'll talk about where I think machines can be very helpful in terms of actually managing pension assets. And as Professor mentioned, along the way, I spend a lot of time writing about pension reform uh, for fun. This is my, my social service. A and I'll talk about one of the innovations we've got today, which actually has a lot to do with how we can improve pensions in Spain. So I'm going to mix two different things in my presentation. One is I'm going to talk about technological innovations, what I think technology can do and not do. But then I'm also going to talk about some very basic things, because I don't think finance theory gets it correct. Okay. So the agenda for my presentation is, I want you to understand as a practitioner, what are the things that technology is good at and not so good at? Uh, because I've made some mistakes again, even using technology to manage pension assets. But if we understand the limitations, I think we can actually come to a better solution. But especially at AFI, where you're using quantitative finance and you're using finance theory, then the question we have to ask is, is this theory correct if we want to look at the pension problem? And I'm going to make a very bold statement, which I hopefully can prove, that I think finance theory also needs to be revisited. Nuria talked about how we need to revisit the work retirement model. I think the academic finance models for retirement also need to be revisited because a lot of the academics who even got Nobel Prizes made some very basic mistakes that can lead to very bad conclusions. Okay? I think rather than talking about artificial intelligence, I like this term which I call augmented intelligence. And the idea here is that I don't think in our industry computers are going to replace humans. Because we're de dealing with behaviors, we're dealing with data, we're dealing with you know, various issues that I don't think you can program into a computer. But I think computers can be very helpful because in a way, ours is a big data problem. When I set up my company 16 years ago, I built the technology company on the idea that finance is a big data problem. How do we as decision makers take lots and lots of data happening all over the world instantaneously and convert it into good decisions? I wish I'd come up with the word big data 16 years ago. Uh, I wasn't smart enough for that. But today, that's now the buzzword, right? 
And finally, as I said, I'm going to talk about this idea that Professor Merton and I have been mentioning uh, to many countries around the world. It's a very simple financial innovation that we think can simplify the retirement problem to something even a person with a high school degree is going to be able to solve. We cannot have complicated models that only Nobel Prize winners understand because otherwise we will never have a safe pension for the broader population. So to the primary question you ask in your conference, which is, will robot pay your pensions? In the old days, as Nuria mentioned, computers were traditionally very good at data, record keeping, and speedy analysis. Right? So that was the technology that I grew up with. Uh, when we were looking at computers, we looked at it as a pure software play. How can we have all this data in a central place? How can we make sure people get their information accurately? How can we process it if we have a good model to do that? So what I was arguing, and I'll come to this in a little bit more detail, is that to be successful in managing a pension fund or managing an insurance company, you're judged by the quality of the decisions you make. Should I buy more stocks? Should I buy more bonds? When should I buy it? Finance theory isn't very good about giving you such information, and I felt that you can actually use technology to create a kind of GPS for a pension fund. So I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. Now what we are finding, and I, I just noticed this on the internet, but in America, interestingly enough, there's a new trend of products called robo-advisors. I don't know if you're familiar with it, yes. but I noticed there's a company called Indexa Capital, which is a robo-advisor, and they claim that they can replace humans. Now, along my various experiences, I was an advisor to one of the robo-advisors in America, which has, I think, about eight billion in assets, which is quite frightening, because I think this claim is completely bogus. And I'm going to prove to you that the techniques that they're using are dangerous and are actually going to cause problems, okay? Because the danger is they're basing these models that they have computerized and they're using software as a replacement for good analysis. Okay, and it's based on bad finance theory and bad instruments, and it cannot lead to a good result. So then the question that Nuria and Seth asked is, can AI or machine learning fill the gap? And interestingly enough, about three years ago, I was approached by IBM Watson's group in the United Kingdom because somebody had told them that I'm using technology to make better investment decisions, and they wanted to see if IBM Watson could be used to make better financial decisions. I'm assuming everyone's familiar with IBM Watson. This is the super brilliant sort of uh, capability that they've built that even won the best quiz competition in America by beating all the people. It plays chess very well. It plays Go very well, all these games. So I gave them a test data set that I use to make money for my clients. And for two weeks, I didn't hear back from anybody. And then finally, my contact at IBM called me up and said, uh, the scientists want to know what's the relationship between the different data variables, which then kind of defeats the point because if I'm going to tell Watson what's the relationship between the price of stocks and the various elements that go into it, why do I need Watson, right? Uh, so while it might seem that there isn't a big future in using techniques like Watson, we as humans are also biased. And so whatever models I've built using my capabilities are biased by my limited knowledge. And I think the role technology and machine learning and AI will play will be to expand the scope of that. So for example, when I started my company you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have satellite data on whether or not ships are sitting high or low in the water. Today, that data is used to decide whether trade is increasing or the price of oil should go down. Right? The data that's available literally tracks which second how many people are walking into a supermarket. And that tells people whether to buy that company or not. So the quality of the data and the size of the data has increased that this is where machine learning and AI will be able to help individuals make better decisions, okay? So before we go into all these complicated issues, I'm going to take one step back and talk about the most basic question, which is when we talk about pensions, what are we really talking about? And it's actually some basic finance and economics theory that walks us through the savings, investment, and decumulation decision. And the reason I'm doing that is not to sort of waste your time you know, telling you about Nobel Prize winning papers, but is to show you what assumptions these people made and how we're using these theories to manage assets 
and how these could go really wrong. So the first paper I have to start with is the paper of my advisor, Professor Modigliani, uh, The Life Cycle Hypothesis. If you've taken a basic economics class, it's a classic. And you wonder, after I explain this slide, why he got a Nobel Prize for this paper, because it's such a simple paper. And he was asking the question, why is it that people save money? And he essentially said, and I'll, I'll assume Nuria is not in the room so I can make this comment, that uh, we have people who are 25 years old, let's say at this date, and they live for 60 years. And because they live for 60 years, they have to consume every year. So Professor Modigliani made a very simple statement that let's assume we know that they consume a fixed amount. Okay, so that's not a complicated assumption. The second thing he noted was, however, we work for 40 years over which we get an income. But because we have no income in this period after our retirement, we need to save some money from the income earning period to keep aside for retirement. Like I said, this is such a simple idea. Why does somebody get a Nobel Prize? The genius was, when he wrote it, nobody had even thought about it, okay? Now, what he was noticing is that different countries have different level of savings depending on whether they were young countries or old countries, not whether they were rich or poor. So if you're a young country, then you're in the savings mode, so you can have a very high savings rate, even if you're very poor like India. And an older country like Spain, which may be spending all that money, may be this saving, right? So that was the genius of his paper. And as I said, with simple equations that a high school student can use, he showed these insights. But he also showed something very interesting, is that as we save, we start to accumulate these assets to the date of retirement, which have to be at a particular level, because only if they're at that level can we then spend it down in retirement to be able to finance our consumption, right? And interestingly, there's a very unique rate of return that solves this problem if we make the assumption that we know all these parameters. Now, life is not that simple. We don't know a lot of things. We don't know how long we're going to work. We don't know, you know how much we're going to consume. We don't know how much income we're going to have. But it's a very beautiful model that sets it up, and this is one of the first Nobel Prizes you can attribute that was given to somebody thinking about pension issues, and it led to a lot more Nobel Prizes as well. So let me just take Franco's original idea and show it from a slightly different perspective, which is the perspective I wish he had presented, which is to say, let's restate the retirement problem not as finding the unique rate of return on investments that we should make, but instead, what are the cash flows we need when we hit the age of 65? Again, with apologies to Nuria, but let me just make that simple assumption. So if we assume that people work for 40 years and we know that they stay retired for 20 years, people are more likely to say that they want to have a lifestyle in retirement that's very similar to what they had before they retired. That's typically the way we think about retirement. And more importantly, they want a steady cash flow in real terms, right? So what's interesting is this set of columns, which is a steady cash flow, looks more like a bond than it looks like a stock. Yet when we examine the portfolios of people who are saving for retirement, they have a lot of stocks in it, which means a lot of people are taking a lot of risk without understanding that this is the challenge that they're going to face if the market doesn't do well. And I feel today, in fact, I've made my clients money this year on the assumption that stocks were going to do badly too many people are thinking that the market always goes up and therefore they get into trouble because they've got essentially a bond-based liability. Okay? So I wish Franco had stated his presentation this way because it changes the whole set of assumptions that comes after that. Okay? So I'm gonna just take a quick quiz in the room. There's no correct answer. Supposing I asked you this question and you had to live for 20 years in retirement, what is the easiest way for you to re express your retirement ambition? Is it to say, I need 1 million euro on my retirement date, or is it easier to say I need 50,000 euros in today's euros? Just show of hands, how many of you would pick A as the objective and how many would pick B? There's no correct answer. So how many would pick A as your retirement objective? Okay. No, A. First A. Uh, so wealth. Wealth is your target, right? You have a target wealth in mind. And how many pick B? Oh, I think my presentation is over then. <laughs> Essentially, this is one of the geniuses of what Professor Merton started to write about, you know, maybe a few years ago, 
saying that most people can express their retirement ambition in cash flow terms. They cannot express it in wealth terms. None of us have an idea of what is our retirement target when we hit 65 if I ask you to give me a wealth number. But I can tell you that based on my lifestyle today, if I had maybe 70% of today's income, maybe I can have the same lifestyle I want, okay? And this changes everything in finance now. So the next Nobel Prize goes to Markowitz, who wrote this brilliant paper in 1952. So talk about Nuria laughing about our models of retirement being from the you know, second industrial revolution. Uh, our models of finance also go back to the 1950s. And he was trying to answer the question that Modigliani raised, which is what's the way to achieve this target rate of return that we need for our investments? I'm sure all of you have seen some variation of this chart, which is called the efficient frontier. But basically what, what Markowitz said is that if we know the expected return of assets, volatility of assets, and correlations, and I've colored it here so that orange is bonds, purple is equity, and blue is alternatives, we get this beautiful picture, which gives us then an optimal portfolio. And Markowitz's first paper essentially allowed people to start to use computers to make this calculation. Right? Today, you have anybody who has a computer who can program this, even in Excel, and it'll spit out your optimal portfolio. But the danger with the machine is it can pick some crazy combinations. Right? Here, I've drawn charts that look very sensible. But if you look inside the computer, there could be portfolios that are absolutely bizarre that are sitting on this thing we call the efficient frontier. So what happens is we as humans then put constraints saying, don't put a portfolio that has 90% in alternatives because I cannot sell this to my client. It cannot have more than 40% in bonds. Essentially, we're picking the portfolio, yet we're using the machine to do the calculations, right? So the other problem, which I won't spend a lot of time on, is when we pick this optimal portfolio, Markowitz assumed that our measure of risk is volatility. But all of you in the financial space know that truly the measure of risk is protection of capital. Right? If you, ha you cannot pay your pension with volatility. But if you preserve your capital, you have a better chance of paying your pension. Now, the reason they did this was because it's easy in the mathematics and I know we have some expert mathematicians here, so I'm a little scared. But it's not easy to write models with this. So finance theory assumed that volatility is the measure of risk. And therefore, we've all used this. And now we're making this our basic assumption. So what could go wrong with such a beautiful model? Right? And I've made this mistake many times. Essentially, the assumption that Markowitz makes that we know what the future looks like, the expected returns, the volatilities, and other assets, is a huge, huge assumption. And I made this huge mistake on a $10 billion portfolio in 1998. But what I have here is a slide where a gentleman asked Wall Street analysts, which is the gray columns here, what is their expectation of the stock market going one year forward? And then he actually compared it to what the market actually did, which is the darker columns. And you see two interesting patterns. One is the analysts never expected the market to go down. Okay, so that column is always positive. And it would be so lovely if somebody could actually give me that kind of a return that they expected. Sadly, the market doesn't behave like that. And I think we're going exactly into an environment that people have forgotten about, which is a negative market. Right? We've seen 2008 before. 2018 looks a lot like 2007 to me. The second problem was even if they got the direction correct, they didn't get the magnitude correct. So the single biggest input into these beautiful models that get Nobel Prizes is fundamentally flawed. Right? The question then is, is this the only problem in these models? Right? The sad part is, even the other assumptions we make, we have no ability to forecast. Because even this thing we call volatilities are volatile. Right? Here, oh sorry, in the red line, I show the volatility of the US stock market, but you can do it for the Spanish stock market. And you can see it's going all over the map. Right? It's a little bit like a drunk driver on a road going in any direction. So the question for you as the user of the machine is, which number do I pick? Right? And the same thing with correlations. We were talking about this earlier. Many people write arguments and papers about 
you know, why you should be in stocks or stable value funds based on assumptions about correlations, this is not just one value, it's moving all over the place. So, if you put this into a machine, that machine is going to do some very basic things for you, which is it'll put a lot more money into the assets that you're optimistic about, and it'll put a lot more money into the assets you misestimate the risk of. So interestingly enough, if you blindly use machines, these are error optimizers, okay? But I would say 90% of the industry globally uses these techniques to set the asset allocation, which is the single biggest decision in the fund. And I made this mistake in 1998, where I made these estimates, I tried to use the most complicated models, and when the market blew up in 2000, I was calling up my colleagues saying, please don't go back to that naive portfolio I set up, but we didn't listen because we were basing our models on theory. Okay. So the beauty of technology, like uh, Seth and Nuria were showing, is innovation wants to try to displace people like us. Right? There are these young people in Silicon Valley who think that, why have gray hair, right? We can write this into a code, and this robo machines have now become very popular in America. I think there's at least 50 to 70 billion of assets already being managed purely by robos where literally you go onto your cell phone and you answer five questions, and they come back and they tell you, here's your optimal portfolio, okay? And we're going to constantly rebalance back to this portfolio. Now, what it's been very good at is it reaches millennials. The young people are very uh, you know, appreciative of these technologies because they don't like to talk to human beings. My kids you know, are more likely to text me than call me up, right? So that's why they've been able to get a lot of clients it's very quick, it keeps fantastic records, and it allocates to ETF. So the whole argument is it's quick, it's low cost, why do you need human beings? We can take care of you, right? The interesting thing is they don't ask anybody what their retirement ambition is. So Professor Hersey and I can go and enter the same inputs, and it's gonna give us the same portfolio, even though he and I could be in completely different financial circumstances. The chance that the robo is getting everybody's portfolio correct is close to 0%, right? They're also using this wrong modern portfolio theory to build these optimized portfolios with no protection if the market should change. And then they follow this thing called rebalancing. Is everyone familiar with what rebalancing is, right? So we're told in finance theory that once you get this optimal portfolio, you have to constantly go back to that portfolio either every quarter or if the portfolio goes outside the ranges. And in fact, I saw on the Indexa Capital website that they claim that they can get you a half a percent or more year just by blindly rebalancing. In the United States, if they had put that claim on their website, they would have got a lawsuit immediately. And they base it on flawed evidence from the Yale uh, CIO who wrote a book, which I actually proved to Yale staff was wrong. Okay? So they make these wrong assumptions about rebalancing generating value, and I'll talk about that in a second. Okay? So I think robo-advising as it stands today in the US is only a disaster waiting to happen. I don't know when, but if we get a repeat of 2008, all of these funds are going to explode. And because there's so much competition, because there's really no specialization, they're all competing on price, and therefore they're going to have a lot of trouble. Okay? So I did a simple experiment to show you the dangers of robo-advising or even these naive 60-40 portfolios that we all use. And I was trying to show how these portfolios are dangerous in terms of thinking about society's retirement security. And I just assumed that I had 100,000 to invest for 10 years. So I took 10-year groups of people starting in 1977, and I just kept rolling them by one month. So I had 10 years of which they saved. Each year they saved about $10,000, and they were investing it in a 60-40 portfolio, right? So if you bought a robo, this is what it was going to do. You're 55 years old, you would save for 10 years, 100,000, and then I measure your real wealth on the day you retire. And here's what's amazing, is the person who retired in the first period got 200,000 in real dollars, but if you ended up retiring a few years later, or a few months later, so your twin brother uh, or your younger brother retires a few years later, they could have a dramatically different income. So in a funny way, if we follow these models, your retirement wealth 
becomes completely a function of when your parents had fun, right? The date of your birth determines how you're going to end up. This is not how we build a robust system of pension security for a country, right? And again, if you had the really bad fortune, you could hit periods in which, in real terms, what your wealth is is even less than what you saved. So this is a really dangerous trend, and this is what 90% of the assets globally, whether it's in defined benefit pension plans or in defined contribution pension plans, are using as techniques. Now, there are enough actuaries in this room, so you know that this is not really the correct picture. So what I did is I said, rather than showing it in wealth terms, let me convert it into a 20-year income stream on the date of retirement to see if that makes it a little bit less of a roller coaster. And you can see that not really. You still get the roller coaster because now you're also dependent on what's happening to interest rates on the date of retirement. So not only do you have the uncertainty of your 60-40 portfolio, but now you also have the uncertainty of interest rates, not only today, but the 20-year interest rates. And Spain even has negative interest rates, right? In Europe, this is another challenge for you. So this is going to look even more volatile than this, right? So then we come to my first fintech innovation. Uh, this is why I set up my company 16 years ago, because as I said, the fund that I was helping manage got destroyed in 2000. My colleagues just blindly rebalanced back to the portfolio I left them with. Fortunately, I'd left and gone to JP Morgan, so it was not my responsibility anymore. And maybe that's why they didn't listen to me. But I realized that if 90% of the risk is coming from the allocation between stocks and bonds, we need to have an intelligent process by which we move that portfolio around. And this is where AI starts to come in. How many of you have a GPS in your car? Most of you, yeah? So let's say you want to go down to the Gran Via, right? You're going to get into your car. In the old days, you would maybe have a map, if you're me, or you know, if you know your way, but you'll drive the normal routes. Today, the beauty of the GPS is it's taking in the data about traffic, it's taking in the data about accidents, it's taking the data of construction to tell you maybe actually going around is much faster and safer than just going directly. So my argument was that investing a portfolio is much the same thing. That is, there's data on the economy that's changing, there's data on the agent's behavior, there are hedge funds playing, there are long-term investors playing. All of that should be translated into simple feedback for people to navigate their portfolios more intelligently. Right? And what we were trying to show people is that computers are actually designed to do this very efficiently. Okay? So what does my GPS look like? And I've made a very simplistic assumption, but because I noticed that at AFI, you have both quantitative finance and technology uh, where you work with uh, financial institutions, this is the type of GPS we produce for our clients where we're telling them, and this is purely hypothetical, that based on today's information around the markets, around the world, rather than being at 60% in stocks, maybe it's better to be at 56.2% in stocks and a little bit more in bonds. So the GPS is now telling you, get away from these assets, and I'll come to why in a second, but not only telling you to get away, but it's telling you exactly how much to get away. So this is where computers are much better than human beings because it takes the emotion out of the picture, but it can give us quantifiable decisions that we can make based on underlying data. Now, the beauty is I can drill down further. So all of these are colored, which says sentiment, economic, valuation, and technical. And I saw that for, for your clients, you build models on exchange rates, interest rates, likely market movements. We're doing something very similar where we're sampling the data from different segments of the markets, different types of agents, each of whom has a different investment horizon, to determine what are they likely to do with their money. And by that, we'll get a sense of whether stocks or bonds or commodities will do better or not, right? I'll just focus on economic to keep it simple. So our global economic model was telling us that global consumption is still quite positive, so that's good for stocks. So there's a tendency to believe that maybe we should be positive on stocks because of that. But as you've noticed, GDP data, even in Europe and Japan, has now been turning negative, right? And the way we were finding that in our models is that central banks are raising interest rates, and also commodity prices have declined in value. 
So we are using the data from the markets to come and tell our clients what is likely to happen. Now the beauty in finance is we are right maybe 55% of the time. Right? So I teach students and I tell them it's a good thing that they're not pilots or doctors because imagine if you came and told your patient, don't worry, I operate but I make a mistake only 45% of the time, you won't have a business, right? In finance, being correct 55% of the time is an extremely successful business because markets lose money 47% of the time. So markets make money on only 52% of the days. So machines can actually help us change that probability of doing dumb things from losing money 47% of the time to losing money 45% of the time. So the bar for innovation to improve finance is extremely low compared to, let's say, designing, you know, deciding whether somebody has cancer and is it fatal or not, right? If you make a mistake there, you lose your life. Here you lose a little bit of money and maybe your client, right? So the beauty is there is a lot of potential for data to be absorbed intelligently by machines to help us make better decisions, and this is kind of how we do it. Now, let me go back again to finance theory and again another Nobel Prize winner, Professor Merton. And he's been arguing for the last few years that finance assumes that the safe asset, which we call T-bills in America, but I think you call it letras in, uh, bonus. in, in spawn. Bonus, bonus is slightly older, but I think the shorter end. If we measure mm -hmm. how the volatility of that looks, for preserving your principle, it looks like a very safe asset, which is why finance theory used it as the safe asset. But if I measure it in terms of how many annuities it can buy me, right, how much income from an annuity, it's an extremely dangerous instrument, right? So I know the chief actuary is here and we were talking uh, during the break. From her perspective, holding bonds in the traditional form is a very risky asset, yet all of finance theory says that that's the safe asset. So any models that have been built to manage pension money using these bad <coughs> models are going to cause a lot of problems. Right? Now what we've known is that we've had a secular decline in inflation and interest rates globally. This is my US chart, but it's even worse in Europe. You've got negative interest rates, which essentially means we're kind of stealing from old people to try to help the young people, which is okay because in social security systems we're doing the opposite, right? Now the good news is hopefully we're at the end of the low interest rate cycle, and now it changes because this has also had a big impact on whether or not people buy annuities, which was the safe asset for retirement, right? So here what I did is I just plotted the 20-year real interest rate and the cost of the annuities, and you can see that the cost of annuities went up, which led to less people buying it. But I personally think that the bigger problem with annuities is that they're illiquid, which means if I die too young, I'm a heart patient, right? So there's a good chance I don't live as long as the life expectancy it may not be bequeathed to my children, right? They're complex. Even I don't understand an annuity and I have a PhD in finance, right? Uh, there are lots of costs and commissions, plus you have the risk that the insurance company could go bankrupt, which means you have credit risk. So Professor Modigliani in his Nobel Prize speech talked about how despite the fact that annuities are a very important instrument when you think about it from these models of finance, the percentage of people who buy that is less than 8% in America, and I think it's probably as low, if not lower, in, in Spain as well, right? So what, again, Professor Merton shows is that the danger is when we show people in their retirement statement the value of the annuity, it looks like it's moving a lot every month, right? And we shouldn't show this in people's retirement statement because if they're not financially sophisticated, they see something changing a lot, and they're likely to pull out of it. However, if we refer to it in terms of how funded is your pension, then it's a flat line. So the way we even produce the reports for people who are not financially sophisticated, right, whether it's electronic or on paper, can cause them to make all sorts of crazy mistakes. And this was the point that Professor Merton was making. As we move from systems where the government and the company looked after you to where you have to look after yourself for retirement. We have to even improve the reporting, which is a very basic idea. So now let me go back to my famous chart, and I'll repeat it a few times, uh, because this will come to my last innovation, which is very simple and dumb, uh, that you'll even wonder why we wrote this paper. Again, let me just assume that everybody wants a state, a fixed sort of cash flow in retirement. And somebody was telling me that the average 
uh, income in Spain is maybe 3,000 euros. So I just tried to model somebody very basic who wanted 3,000 euros in today's euros guaranteed to either inflation or the standard of living. Very simple, right? They want 30,000 today, uh, inflation guaranteed, and that's all they want till the day they died. Oops, sorry, what did I do? Now, supposing you went and bought inflation-linked instruments. I saw that Spain has issued a 15-year euro-linked instrument, but France has issued a 30-year. So the benefit of the euro is you're not just dependent on Spain to hedge euro inflation. But even if you had a 30-year instrument, look at the challenges it poses for you in your pension portfolio. One is it starts paying you coupons well before you need it at retirement. So if you're a 25-year-old and you buy these inflation-linked instruments, it's giving you cash flows before you even need them, right? Two is it gives you a massive amount of your principal back at a time before your retirement, which means you have to reinvest it. But you don't even need that spike in cash because you don't need it that way, right? And three is that the maturity is only 30 years, whereas retirement planning is sometimes maybe a 60-year problem. So all of these challenges make the current instruments in the market extremely unsafe for retirement, right? Now, you can do financial engineering, which makes it costly and makes the banks a lot of money, uh, but it doesn't make it reliable, right? So the idea I had, and then I've uh, partnered with Professor uh, Merton as well, was I first called it bonds for financial security, but with Professor Merton, we've now called it, stand, we've called it selfies, because selfies is a little bit more sexy a term uh, than bonds for financial security. And we call it standard of living index forward starting income only securities. And the basic idea of this bond is that, let's say the Spanish government, or maybe even an insurance company, issues this bond today, which only starts paying people when they get to the age of 65. And unlike the traditional coupon, which was expressed as a percent, here you'll be paid five euros in real dollars. Okay, so it's paid in five euros a year for, let's say, 20 years. It doesn't address longevity, and I'll talk about that maybe in the question and answers, but really simple. So now you're going to get paid $5 real indexed to whatever inflation, and we can talk about that in a little bit as well. Look at how simple the problem is. If you have a high school degree in mathematics, you can now do the math yourself, which is that before you retire, you should make sure you buy 6,000 of these bonds. Why? Because we take that 30,000 goal and just divide it by the five you get a year. If you buy 6,000 of these bonds, you're guaranteed your 30,000 in real terms for your retirement. No more complicated optimizers, no more fake forecasting of expected returns, no more gambling with people's retirement money, right? This actually becomes the completely safe asset in retirement. The beauty of this is it's liquid, which means if I change my mind, I can buy and sell it. If I die young, my children get the bond and they can decide to either keep the cash flow or sell it. And you can do a lot more interesting portfolio creation with this as well. I'm going to maybe end on this slide because I'm short on time and I don't want to interrupt Chris's because I want to hear about Chris. Uh, but we've actually made this proposal now for a number of countries and Professor is helping us write a, a Spanish version as well. We've recommended this for US, Australia, France, Japan, Chile. I was in Colombia two weeks ago. We're doing this there as well. The interesting thing is it's a very good deal for the governments because if many people retire poor, the government is going to have to bail them out. Here, if they create an instrument that allows people to get retirement security on their own, then they won't have to tax rich people to look after poor people who made bad financial decisions. The second interesting thing is I noticed that the Madrid airport, for example, is very old yeah, compared to, let's say, some of China or India. So you need infrastructure in many of these countries the cash flows of these bonds are actually the perfect offset for infrastructure, which every country around the world is struggling to finance. So governments can actually have a very nice way of getting retirement security while funding infrastructure. And if they have a value added tax, then offering a standard of living adjustment, the government is hedged, so they're not taking a lot of risk. But it's also good for individuals because if we're asking them to make their decisions, this now becomes the safe asset in their portfolio. So maybe I'll stop here and we can take more in the question and answers uh, and hopefully that gets the topic going. Thank you very much. That's great, Professor.
I'll, I'll ask now Professor Chris Meyer to join us at this table so that he can manage. Well, uh, there's a lot of open questions for later on when we will open the floor for questions and, and answers. Now, without uh, loss of continuity, let me uh, introduce you Professor Chris Meyer. As I said, uh, Professor Meyer is Paul uh, Milstein Professor of Real Estate at the Columbia Business School. Dr. Meyer uh, is also CEO of Longbridge uh, Financial, an innovative company in the field of reverse mortgages. But as he himself says in the, in the website of his company, responsible reverse mortgage. And I want you to notice this first <laughs> word, responsible reverse uh, mortgages. Uh, he will tell us later on why the rest of uh, reverse mortgages are in that <laughs> responsible. I'm not meaning they aren't uh, responsible at all, but aren't that responsible. He's uh, associate researcher at MBER, director of the National Reserve Mo uh, Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, and member fellow of the academic advisory boards uh, of uh, Standard and Poor's uh, and the Housing Policy Center uh, of uh, the Urban Institute. So it's a real pleasure to have you here, Professor. Meyer, mm, uh, people here has to know that you've been making a big effort to be a uh, couple of hours uh, barely uh, <laughs> right in Madrid for this, uh, for this conference. And I must thank David Babel, who helped me through Professor Olivia Mitchell to find you in the midst um, for inviting you to this, to this conference. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much. I uh, am very grateful for the invitation um, to come and speak. On this, um, I will talk about uh, responsible or irresponsible reverse mortgages. I actually am not sure there are, I don't think there are irresponsible reverse mortgages per se, but there are ways to sell the product or use the product that I think are more or less responsible than others. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but one of the things I'll sort of say is I have an unusual background. Um, I've spent my career as a uh, professor, I still hold a, uh, still hold a position. I run the Real Estate Center at Columbia Business School. Um, I was dean of the faculty of the business school for a long time, or for several years. And I spent a lot of time during the financial crisis um, doing public policy work. So I testified six times at, um, before the US House and Senate um, on financial policy and how to deal with the housing crisis and actually some of what I wrote turned out to show up in legislation um, at the time. I am, this is not to say I feel that the US did a very good job. I think they kind of did a miserable job <laughs> of managing the crisis, um, particularly from a housing perspective. But coming out of the financial crisis, um, I sort of hit a point in my life, in my career, where I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, because I didn't want to be a dean of a, uh, um, three years in the dean's office was more than enough um, for me in academic administration. Um, and having spent a lot of time in policy side, I became very um, distressed with the state of politics in the United States, and that was even before um, the current presidential election, um, where one could be even more distressed about the state of politics. Um, so I was trying to kind of figure out what I wanted to do with the next stage of my life. So you might ask, how did that lead to founding a reverse mortgage company? Um, the answer was I wanted to sort of think about were there ways where some of the research I had done as an academic could play to help create solutions to significant problems that I didn't feel, and many people didn't feel, were being addressed by policymakers. And retirement is just an enormous challenge that is facing governments around the world. And when you look at the assets available to address the retirement challenge, um, housing is far and away the largest asset available that is currently untapped. And as you'll see in the presentation, um, we'll really talk about how we can do that and how can one sort of think responsibly about 
um, trying to create products or use existing products to tap home equity to address retirement challenges. Um, and I think some of Arun's comments, uh, Arun's comments are going to be things that you can think about in conjunction with using home equity, but the focus of my talk is really going to be how do we tap home equity for retirement. So the first, I'll probably do several things. The first is talk about why we need home equity release. And maybe I probably don't need to spend any time on these slides, but I will for at least a couple of minutes. Um, I've started spending time looking around the world. It's part of why I was really honored to be invited here, because I think we need to think about what people are doing um, and how there is equity release being managed. I'll talk a little bit of how a reverse mortgage works. My guess is if I did a survey of most of you, um, you might get it terribly wrong in terms of how reverse mortgages actually operate, but I should say I'm not an expert in the Spanish reverse mortgage market, which is quite small. Um, we'll talk about the challenges for growing the market and then what I think the future is. Um, so the first is just, we're seeing life expectancy grow in ways that are really um, impressive. If you look at Spain, the, you know, when I spent a little bit of time on the internet, um, one discovers that the Mediterranean diet, healthcare, <laughs> et cetera, are all very good. And in fact, Spain may soon take over from Japan as having the highest life expectancy of any country in the world. Since 2000, the life expectancy starting at age 65 for men, and you can find similar numbers for women, um, has grown about three years. Um, in the United States, it's grown by about a year and a half. Um, so we're seeing people live longer, and that, of course, creates challenges to fund retirement. In the US, it's worse than that. Um, if you look at mortgage debt, average amounts of mortgage debt by age, what you see compared to 2004 and 2014, one of the results of the financial crisis is that many homeowners were using their home as a piggy bank to pull money out. It became very easy to refinance a mortgage and cash out. And as a result, people took on much more mortgage debt without the capability of paying it back. And as you can see, if you look at the, you know, if you look at if this works, you know, this is about retirement age. And what you see is people in retirement age more and more are bringing mortgages with them into retirement. So it's not a question of how do I cover the costs of retirement and healthcare, which in the US is covered to a much lesser extent than it is in many other countries. So households have significant expenses that are unreimbursed from our Medicare system. But now you're also going to have to pay off an existing mortgage. And if you look today at age 65, almost half of all households have a mortgage that they need to pay, and the share of those households is rising, not falling. So we have a really challenging retirement problem because people don't enter retirement breaking even, they're actually entering retirement behind the eight ball. If you look at how people think about this problem, what they, you know, if, you, if I sort of told you, you're entering retirement with more debt than you might have liked, what's your natural instinct gonna be as to what you do? Work longer, right? <laughs> you know, there's not, there not, aren't a lot of other options. I can try and throw it all into stocks and get rid of the bonds entirely. Um, that just doesn't work very well. Um, and for many Americans, they just don't have enough saved that that's even a realistic option. Unfortunately, the work longer has not been a very successful idea. This is in black line is the share of people who are working past age 65 in the United States. It's been going up, but not nearly as much as the share of people who say they expect to work after age 65. So back in 1991, people had roughly rational expectations, which is to say 10% of them said they were gonna work past age 65 and you know 9% of them actually did. 
in 2015, almost half of Americans said they were going to work past age 65, but when you looked at the data, only about a quarter of them do. And so the idea that they're going to work longer is something that turns out to be harder than you might think. And there are lots of reasons for this. If you think about you know, how you're going to manage in retirement, my um, mother-in-law broke her hip when she was um, 65. And it turns out if you break your hip and have a hip replacement, it is a very long recovery process. You can recover fully, but the idea of holding a job over a couple of month recovery when you're not driving and it is a challenge to kind of make it in and around and you need a lot of physical therapy, that's hard. People who have a heart attack, the recovery from a heart attack or cancer. So we cure many more people of diseases than we used to cure but their ability to work through and after that process is not the same. In fact, when you look at the people who are working longer, it tends to be the people who don't need the money, or at least who have, are better prepared for retirement. Mm -hmm. So the largest increases in people working full time are in management, sales, and legal professions. And three of the four largest declines are in low paid professions like food preparation, construction and production, where we're actually seeing fewer people working full-time beyond retirement age. And these are, you know, these are global patterns, not just in the U.S. And what it says is the retirement problem disproportionately is putting more of the burden on lower and middle income households, where they don't have the resources and they're facing challenges in hitting retirement. A few other facts which are, you know, which, you know, further this, 30% of older owners with a mortgage in the United States. So remember I said all these people have a mortgage. If you have a mortgage that you carry into retirement age, um, on average, 30% of those people are going to pay more than half of their income to cover housing expenses. Doesn't leave much else to do anything else. About 35% of people who die in the United States have less than $10,000 in financial assets. They literally ran out of money. Um, that includes homeowners. And finally, we know the elderly don't spend down housing wealth or financial assets to the extent that they could. And so these are really a set of significant challenges. My last chart is on elderly poverty in this, in this area, and you can see Spain actually does very well um, in terms of the old being less likely to be poor. The United States is sort of has slightly higher elderly poverty rates than poverty rates in the country as a whole. Um, but the poverty rates are not really well measured for people relative to housing expenses and mortgages. And this is based on income, not debt. And so I suspect the numbers look worse if you were to take into account mortgage and other housing payments that people have to make in retirement. And then we know the challenges of paying for aging. Share of GDP is rising um, in the US, both on healthcare and social security. And those are very significant challenges. Um, and one doesn't have to spend much time looking in the internet to look at things in Spain to realize the pension challenges and the issues um, that have literally had protests and other things going on in the country. And again, this is not just the US and Spain. These are issues for many, many countries. So how do we think about equity release or home equity release um, if we look around? First, if you look, this is a stunningly large amount of money. In the United States, there are $6.9 trillion with a T in home equity. It is growing on a monthly and an annual basis. That will be over $7 trillion. And there's about 10,000 people that are hitting retirement every day, 65 in the U.S., and so this number continues to rise both as home prices go up and as more people hit retirement. So this is a very large amount of money that is available to think about how to fund retirement. And if you ask me, how do I get into this business? The answer is we need to figure out ways to responsibly tap these resources and to allow people to do it in a way that they feel comfortable and in a way that is fiscally responsible for companies and others offering the product. So how can you tap home equity if you're an elderly person? 
Well, there are a number of things you can do, and this is sort of an abbreviated list. The most common thing that people do in the United States is actually take out another mortgage. Um, that mortgage would either be a traditional mortgage or what we call a HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit. And if you do a home equity line of credit, what you're doing is taking out a loan where you're going to make interest only payments for 10 years. And then at the end of the 10 years, your line of credit disappears. And then you have to turn that loan into a fully amortizing loan that you pay back over the next 10 or 15 years. So imagine that you're 65 years old. Your solution to tapping home equity is to take a loan where you're going to have to make 10 years of payments interest only, and then your payments at age 75 are going to go up by a lot. And you're going to lose access to the line of credit. Doesn't sound like a, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, programs that uh, are not really targeted to the elderly, um, that is not a program that is uh, very well targeted for people who are in, in or near retirement. And a traditional mortgage is no better. You can sell the home and rent. That's very expensive. The transactions costs involved. And then you have all the same investment problems without selfies or other kinds of bonds that you can invest in. You now have the problem of how am I going to outlive my assets? And I would sort of say, as somebody who has a PhD in economics, I don't know how I would run the investment problem that I'm going to have <laughs> when I hit age 65 to try and figure out a stable way to invest and pull money out of a uh, retirement plan. Um, Having people sell their home and put money into a plan that, you know, that has to last their lifetime is an incredibly big challenge and makes little sense for somebody to take on rent payments. And then you have equity release products. The reverse mortgage we'll talk about. Um, those can sometimes have high upfront costs, and, but at least you don't have any payments associated with the reverse mortgage. You can have a life estate, Viagere in Italy, you see these in sometime, you know, some parts of France as well. What you do is you sell your home, you get a bunch of cash, and you live in the home as long as you, you know, as long as you live or as long as you want to. And at the end of that time, the home reverts to whoever purchases the property. And this is a, it's an interesting market. Um, it is not, you know, it's a market that in Italy was stronger than it is, you know, a few years ago and longer than it has been today. We can talk about the advantages and disadvantages. And then there's sale leasebacks where people sell the home and continue to live in it and so sort of pay rent, which again has the problem that you're taking on continuing obligations, which is not the idea of what you want to be doing in retirement. So I think reverse mortgages have a number of advantages over some of these, but I think all of them have the common denominator that at least you're talking about ways that people can pull money out of their home in some way, shape, or form, which helps to solve some of the problems we're talking about. Um, I think in general, the moral hazard problem, which is the maintenance of the home, is a big issue. And if you sold the home to somebody else, your incentive to maintain the home is obviously much lower. And that's a problem with any kind of sale-based contract where you sell the home to somebody else and you get to live in it. I think any program that responsibly pulls money out should not have ongoing mortgage or other payments by a homeowner except in specific circumstances. And I think it's really important that people not have an incentive to take all the money at once. So one of the things about, a, you know, what I think about a responsible reverse mortgage is a responsible reverse mortgage is something that is going to help work and enable somebody to maintain home ownership for their lifetime. And if you take all the money out up front and you don't put it in either annuity or have a line of credit or some other feature that gives you access to the, to the cash over time, that to me creates problems. So anything where I sell the home and get a bunch of money up front has, again, the same investment. Another problem that we talked about before, and that's the big issue with the VAG, is, you know, I have a bunch of money, now what do I do with it? Um, you have transactions costs, and then you have problems with the kids. The kids are always a problem. <laughs> I actually think they're much less of a problem than people think. Um, <laughs> So if you look at the size of the global equity release market, I have two columns. The first column in blue is the size in dollars, in billions. And the second is if you normalize the market and scale it by the size of the US relative to the size of the elderly population. 
Um, so this is sort of on a relative, how pop, how much, re, how much reverse mortgage activity is there relative to the size of the elderly population? So if you look at that chart on the right, the U.S. is actually not a very big market. Even Spain, believe it or not, is a little bit bigger than the U.S., um, normalized by the size of the elderly market. So you might sort of say, all right, well, we're rescinding the invitation for this guy to come <laughs> because he's coming to talk about reverse mortgages from the U.S. And what has he got to say? It's a tiny market. Um, and it is a tiny market, right? $9 billion dollars on a you know six point nine trillion dollar asset class you know is less than a drop in the bucket um, on that these are annual originations so maybe you can get the number to look a little bigger because it's a stock versus a flow but you can only get so big mm -hmm. um, if you look however the US market used to be a lot bigger and if you look at the time when it was at the peak it actually peaked during the financial crisis which is not surprising because that's when people's, you know, even though home values were falling, their stock accounts were really getting crushed and they were looking for any money whatsoever. The problem is what's driving the U.S. market has been more about government policy because virtually all U.S. reverse mortgages are backed by the U.S. government. It's being driven more by policy as opposed to underlying economics or need. And that's a really big problem for the U.S. because we haven't built or we are just building a private non-government market, but that market was mostly crowded out by government policy in this. Um, so I would expect this year, for example, the US will do fewer reverse mortgages um, than the UK, despite having a population of elderly less than 25% of that of the UK. If you look at Canada, for example, this looks to me a lot more like I, what I would have expected, which is the market is gaining traction. There's now a second bank who is just focused on originating reverse mortgages, um, and it's starting to become a little more of a mainstream product. Um, and home values in Canada have been rising, so there's a lot more home equity available, and Canadians are doing more with reverse mortgages. The market that, to me, seems like it's the market that has gotten the greatest acceptances in the UK. The UK originates about the same number of home equity release products as the US, despite having, again, an elderly population that is about 11 million as opposed to 47 million in the US. Much, much smaller elderly population, same market size. Um, and it has been growing very rapidly. If you look at the UK market, some of the largest um, insurance companies and financial planning firms are actually the companies that are issuing these reverse mortgages, which makes tremendous sense when you think about who has long-lived assets and what a reverse mortgage can do as a hedge. Because if you have life insurance, what happens when you have life insurance? Well, people make a bunch of payments to a life policy, and then when somebody dies, the insurance company has this big lump sum payment they make. Well, what do you think about a reverse mortgage? Over time, people take money and pull it out of a reverse mortgage over time, and then when somebody dies, there's a big payment when you pay the lender back. Well, that looks like the mirror image of life insurance. And so if you're a life insurance company, your reverse mortgage has a lot of ways that you can actually create a very good hedge. And because it is also a hedge for longevity, um, it mirror the asset and liability uh, mix makes a lot of sense for those companies. So from an investment perspective, if you're the CIO, the chief investment officer, this is a pretty good product for you to be investing in. Of course, you're now layering on home price risk, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about that because that's not a trivial issue. Um, if you look in the UK, another thing I like a lot about the market is the bulk of products are products that are drawdown products as opposed to lump sum. There are, by the way, reasons why people should take out a lump sum reverse mortgage. The easiest one is, suppose you have an existing mortgage you have to pay off. It looks like I'm taking a bunch of money up front, but if what I'm doing is paying off a mortgage that I was going to have to make payments on for the next 15 years, what looks like a lump sum is actually really the equivalent of annuitizing, because what I'm doing is saving myself payments that I was otherwise going to make over the next 15 years. 
And so lump sum, when you look at data on lump sum, because somebody takes money out up front doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing this in a way that, you know, would be, you know, irresponsible or leaving them with no proceeds. You know, getting rid of a mortgage payment is kind of the same thing as taking an annuity or, you know, at least a, you know, a fixed, fixed term annuity in terms of payment. Um, and in the UK, there's a lot of people who are using this in some way, shape, or form with the line of credit, which seems to me to be a very good thing. Um, one of the things around the, you know, in looking at, at your talk, one of the things I will say is people, given the choice of reverse mortgages, choose, you know, annual or sorry, monthly payments about as frequently as they choose annuities, which is almost never. Mm -hmm. um, I also find that puzzling um, as an economist who sort of thinks that if you don't have a pension, what you want is a base of income, or if you do have a pension but it's not big enough, what you want is a base of income that lasts, you know, that you can have manage over time. Part of it is these payments are not hedged, you know, when you buy an annuity, you don't get the hedge to consumption that a selfie has, which is a big deal. Um, a lump sum, or sorry, the a line of credit, if you think about what people have in retirement, I think for many of them, a line of credit is a great product. Imagine the kinds of things that happen to you. You're living in your home and your roof needs to be fixed. And how are you gonna pay for your roof getting fixed? Well, you need a bunch of money, $15,000 or whatever the cost is, you need to pay that at once. Your car breaks and you finally gotta get a new car. Same thing. You, so I think people often have these lumpy kinds of expenditures, or you decide you want to take your family for your 75th birthday, you want to go to, you know, Turks and Caicos or wherever, uh, you know, some fun place to go with the kids and grandkids. Same thing, you spend a bunch of money up front and then you don't do a trip like that for a while. So I think line of credit products meet the kinds of needs that people have where their consumption has a smooth component, which is I got to eat you know, pay my expenses every day. And then it has a lumpy component, which are about these one-time things that happen over time. And so to me, a line of credit is a very good product for many people. And when given the choice, many people, the bulk of people actually pick that type of a product. So how do reverse mortgages work in the US? Um, I'll talk a little bit about, there's similarities generally around the world in at least certain features. The age depends a little bit. In the United States, you have to be at least 62 to take out a reverse mortgage. The loan to value ratio is going to be anywhere from 25 to 60% of the value of the home. And this is a lot lower than you can get in a traditional mortgage, but remember, you're not making payments. The interest is accruing, so the balance is growing over time. And so the younger you are, the lower the amount you can borrow and borrow responsibly, because the balance is gonna grow at an interest rate that is faster than the home is expected to appreciate. The payments to the borrower, or to the consumer are tax-free. Um, remember, this isn't income. So these are not earnings from stocks. What you're doing is taking money that you already have paid taxes on, and you're borrowing money from an asset and receiving payments from it. So it's not really income, it's really payments or cash flow from an asset that are not earnings. And so as a result, in most places, there's no reason you should be expected to pay tax on that money. Um, in the, the, the HECM program is US government insured. That is a mixed blessing. Um, in some ways, having the government create a market is really good because there's no credit risk. Um, and the government can create a line of credit that lasts for decades. The downside is, as I'll show you, the government's not really very good at managing this stuff. In fact, the government's, well, yeah, the government's not very good at managing this. Um, as in most places, this is a non-recourse loan. So you don't owe any money if at the end of the time you die, your balance is greater than the home value, which means implicitly you're receiving two kinds of insurance that consumers otherwise economists think don't get enough of. One of them is longevity insurance. The easiest way for your home to be worth less than the mortgage balance is to live to 105. Because the balance is accruing every year at an interest rate greater than home value. So the easiest way for that non-recourse provision to matter is to live a very long time. 
But that's actually exactly insurance that people should be getting, which is if you live a really long time, you should actually still be able to live in your home, and that's offset by people who live a very short time and where the mortgage is expensive. The other thing is you're buying um, home price insurance. So if home prices go down, the typical reverse mortgage is not like a line of credit where it gets cut off, but you have locked in the ability to borrow based on the origination value of the home. And that provides home, that provides home price insurance, which is also a hedge that I would say a lot of economists feel homeowners should have. Um, repayment is deferred till the end. And the, most of those features are common across countries. If you read about them in the press, it's a very different perception. <laughs> what are your obligations? Live in the home permanently. You have to stay current on taxes and any other assessments. Oh. I'm off by, uh, um, you have to keep homeowner's insurance and maintain the home. All right, so I'm going to skip through a little bit. Um, I've talked about some of these pieces. Um, ten. Ten, all right. <laughs> um, I set my uh, alarm. So not surprisingly, research in finance basically says that if you use a reverse mortgage, um, your probability of a successful retirement is much higher than if you don't, or if you use it as a last resort. And this is, there's a series of papers published in financial planning, you know, journals, but it's not a shock if I tell you that if you have 250,000 of stocks and bonds and 250,000 of home equity, if you only use the stocks and bonds, it's not shocking to discover that your likelihood of a successful retirement is lower than if you also use the 250,000 of home equity. So that, didn't require rocket science to do. So what are the challenges of this? I've done work looking at the moral hazard or maintenance problem. We're not sure at the moment how much of this is just the elderly don't maintain their homes, period, or elderly who take out reverse mortgages maintain them less. But over a 10 to 15 year period, houses with a reverse mortgage appreciate less than other homes. So in other words, the collateral isn't quite as good as you'd like it to be. Um, for reverse mortgages. There are things you can do with that. You can you know, do a better job of managing the appraisals. You can avoid borrowers who really don't have any money, which is what reverse mortgages were originated for a while in the US. You can minimize the availability of upfront cash relative to ongoing line of credit. It turns out the lowest price homes do pretty poorly. This is not a great program for people who don't have the resources to live in their home unless they have a pension or something else to help them. Um, and the US government has not done a great job of managing the program. The other big problem, of course, is home prices and volatility. And you know, this is not news in Spain um, to, uh, to talk about the issue. If you have a negatively amortizing loan and home prices have doubled, um, there is no easy way for a financial institution to originate that and hedge it in the face of that kind of home price volatility. And so there has to be some kind of underwrite. Now, that's true of traditional mortgages also, except that you don't allow people to default on their mortgages here. They keep the, the debt going forward. In the U.S., people can default and hand the keys back to the bank. And we could talk at another time about whether that's a good or a bad idea. They're, they're trade-offs. But... You know, how do you manage that and longevity risk? I think you control loan to value ratios. But remember, the moral hazard is not there, at least in the way it would be in the US, to hand the keys back to the bank. Because even if your reverse mortgage is underwater, where else are you going to go live? If you hand the keys back to the bank, you still need a place to live. And living in that home was no cost. So you don't have the incentive to default that a person with a traditional mortgage does. So there are, this is not quite as unstable a loan as a traditional mortgage. But this is a, you know, if you, longevity can be hedged by going to certain institutions, but it's still a real problem. You know, the house price volatility, you have to manage that in the same ways you manage the mortgage system, which is you have to spread the risk and you have to try and have instruments that discourage, um, you know, moral hazard and walking away from the product, which is at least one of the things this is good at. Do you have a, in, in Spain, do you have a saying, you know, talking about the 800 pound gorilla in the room? 
I've spent the entire time talking about reverse mortgages, and I haven't actually talked about the biggest problem with reverse mortgages, which is, of course, the reputation yeah. of the product. Yeah. Um, so that's our 800-pound gorilla. Um, this is something, having traveled to many places, um, and El Mundo sent me um, some comments to do an interview, and the first comment was about a TV show um, where the leading actor basically was given the chance to be a spokesperson for reverse mortgage, and he said, I'd never do that. That's terrible for my reputation. <laughs> um, this is true. This is an issue everywhere you know, you go. They're too expensive, they're sold by shady companies. You know, we could go on for a long time about the issues. I think this is a really serious problem for the development of the market. And it's part of actually what I, you know, the small contribution I hope to have as an academic is to be able to bring at least a little bit of a reputation into the business. And I've had a number of people tell me, what's a nice guy like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> um, so, you know, it may just, Finish my reputation, whatever of it there was. Um, so I, you know, I'm I totally willing to accept that. But there's a recognition that when you are selling a product to a vulnerable population, it is a very challenging circumstance. You know, when I talk to people in my company every day, we all talk about the idea that our client base, 100% of them, are a vulnerable population, and we need to think about who we're dealing with in the same way that we would think about talking to our parents or our grandparents and helping them solve retirement issues. I think you can build, and most reverse mortgage companies in the US anyway, I'm not saying I don't know them other places, you know, most of the people in the industry are people who are really trying to help solve retirement problems for the elderly and are honestly doing the best job they can. But you miss even once and somebody mis, you know, misuses something, you have a salesperson that sells something in an inappropriate way, and you know, the results are rough. And when you're serving a vulnerable population, you have to recognize that that's going to come with the territory, unfortunately. And we have a very, very strong standard within the company. We record every single call, we listen to calls, we have you know, had to fire a person for having conversations we didn't think are appropriate. But there's simply no way to police every person who's doing everything in the world. And, you know, every, any mistake that is made to a 65-year-old is a catastrophic mistake. And if you're going to have a market serving the elderly with financial products, you have to recognize that there is going to be some of that that is inevitable no matter what you do from a compliance perspective. And if that inevitability means that you end up with newspaper articles and congressional hearings, which then say this is a terrible product and regulators are come in and say you can't do this, then we're not going to ultimately be able to create markets to solve problems. And so I think all countries have to deal with the issue of if you're going to solve issues for the elderly, you have to deal with the way, with how to deal responsibly, and this is probably more broadly true of financial products being sold to consumers who don't have financial sophistication. This is a very hard problem. I'm not saying there are easy answers to it. Um, the other big thing is the negative reputation creates this vicious cycle, which is consumers, it makes intuitive sense to them, but they have a very, very hard time sort of getting their head around it. It's a complicated product. And as a result, it requires an enormous amount of selling. Many people get into the process, they talk to their kids or neighbors who are like, I didn't realize you're in such bad financial shape that you're doing this. You know, are, are things really that bad? Are you, you know, cutting open, you know, cat food cans to eat? You literally hear those kinds of conversations with people around someone who has gotten educated about reverse mortgages. And then they drop out and they're like, you know, I just don't want other people to think, badly of me or my kids to think badly of me. I'd rather just go without and not do this. As a result, it's a very expensive product to sell. Mm -hmm. And as an expensive product to sell, it is also then an expensive product for consumers because of the same issue. When you look at the UK, and I'm flying to London on Monday and spending a, you know, do have a set of meetings with people, I think as a product gets scale, the costs go down, and one of the challenges of this thing is how do you get the costs to make sense for people? 
with a product that they're skeptical of. And that's a hard problem. The other big problem is the cross-sell temptation. You know, if you're trying to rip somebody off who's elderly, what you want to do is go look for the money. So a lot of relatively poor elderly, most of their money is sitting in their home. So if you want to sell them a really crummy, expensive financial product, what you want to do is find someone to give them a reverse mortgage and then have them buy this really crummy, expensive financial product with the proceeds associated with the reverse mortgage. It's called cross-selling. It's a big problem because in essence, you know, you have to really work on it. Our company has safeguards built in, including reaching out to consumers during and after the sales process, where we actually ask them what they're going to do with the proceeds. And we've built in a lot of controls. I think the cross-selling issue is one that you can actually do something about um, if you build in appropriate safeguards to address it. Um, it's also one where you need reputable companies who are in the business. Talked about Robert Merton's views on this. I'll skip ahead and talk about the future. Um, I only have a couple minutes left. Um, if I think about the future of this product, I'm going to sort of list, I'm not necessarily going to make a point estimate on this because I've learned a long time ago economists <laughs> never do a forecast and a date in the same sentence, and I'm not going to change that view. Um, so these are the things I think we need to think about in order for the market to have be more broad, to face broader acceptance. The first is, can we get financial planning companies, pension funds, life insurance companies to actually enter this business? Companies that are reputable, that hold capital, that are regulated. Um, but that means regulators have to let them do it and not impose hurdles that are so high that the companies say, you know what, it's just not worth it. Um, the UK is an example of how this can become mainstream, and if it becomes mainstream as part of a financial planning process, you can see significant advantages. Um, the negative perception, again, you need name brand companies, financial services companies around the world right now don't have the world's greatest reputation. Um, so I'm not sure how name brand companies necessarily help um, because people are still worrying about having bailed out a bunch of them. Um, I will say that that's more banks and insurance companies. And so insurance companies have some hope here in the way that banks are facing a harder time. But we've got to make it easier for them to come in and I think the sensational stories in the media, I, I, you know, you can't tell the press not to be sensational. Um, and some of the stories are true. It's not what they're covering has no fact basis in it. It's just that the kind of reporting that is sensational disproportionately harms this particular product and demographic. Um, talked about regulation, I'm happy to talk more. We've talked about needing to fund a line of credit. That really means you need, rent, you need financial institutions to be in this because you can't offer a long-lived line of credit. It's very hard to do it in a securitization market. And I can talk more about the challenges of that, but securitization markets are good about collecting money up front and paying it out. They're not really very good about giving money and then collecting it at the end. That's not how securitization works. There are creative solutions, but it's very hard to do. Um, we know that the share of the population over age 65 is going to continue to rise. And so to me, this is sort of the immovable object kind of meeting you know, the, the big rock, right? If not home equity, what else? What else are we going to do to address this problem? And if we don't think about home equity, what are the other things we're going to be cutting or not doing as a result of that? Are we going to provide less health care? Are we going to raise taxes on the smaller share of the population that is working? And how are we going to manage this in a low interest rate environment where people inherently have a harder time saving in a lower growth environment because the money they put away today grows less than it used to because we don't have the same rate of economic growth? So all these problems are sitting here. <laughs> Maybe robots will help. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Meyer, for sticking to the uh, time. And uh, for this uh, encouraging uh, lecture, that I'm sure, and I've seen uh, you guys over there are taking uh, good notes of what 
Professor Muralida and Professor Maya have said so far. Uh, I won't make any question to them right now. I will open the floor for you to uh, place your questions to Professors Muralidar and, and, and Mayer, and, and also for uh, our two speakers this morning, early, uh, Professor Benzel and Dr. Uh, uh, Oliver. Uh, so I invite them to come to this uh, uh, table, we, we shall arrange for one more chair. Uh, it's a bit... Uh, good. That's great. Right. So, uh, let's uh, perhaps devote uh, 15 to 20 minutes for open questions and, and answers on the issues we've been dealing with at this conference. There are a lot of, of issues we uh, can uh, uh, evoke right now, but I'll let you just to raise your hands and then somebody will uh, offer you a microphone for uh, you to be able to pose your questions and any one of uh, the persons here in this table uh, will answer you if uh, requested to. And then 10 final minutes for uh, wrapping up conclusions and perhaps uh, basic recommendations for policy. The floor is open. Dave, here. Here. The question for Arun. Uh, is that how you pronounce it? Yes, Arun? Okay. Um, you, the examples that you gave for this uh, annuity-based product, uh, you always had a, an assumed lifetime, lifespan. Um, does your product actually take into account uncertainty in lifespan? Um, that's a great question. So the way we did this, and interestingly enough, uh, Professor Hersey has just published a very fascinating paper using a similar concept, which is we break retirement into two pieces. One is a known window, which is the average life expectancy of a country, and then you have the longevity piece. What we find is, in typical defined benefit arrangements, because the poor and the minorities tend to be short-lived, they are subsidizing the rich. So it's the completely wrong way to finance retirement. By making the bond have the average life expectancy of the country, we're ensuring that the poor get covered for their life expectancy, and hedging longevity risk becomes a rich person's problem. So I've created a second bond, which I didn't have the time to talk about, and I call it the live bond, which is called the longevity indexed variable expiration bond, having very much the same type of properties of the selfies, which is that it has a payment profile that declines over time as more and more of the population dies, issued by the government based on taxes of the cohort. So you can have cohort-based hedging of longevity risk through a different instrument. So by splitting the problem into two, and it's so funny that we were working on the same problem from a different perspective, you make it much more manageable. Uh, because if you try to blend the longevity into the income, then it gets too expensive, it gets too complicated, so we said let's split the two. So the idea was the selfies would be the mass marketed you know, piece of it. But then it also gives insurance companies the ability to better hedge their liabilities because they can create ladders and things like that, which they can't do today. So if the second bond was never created, the idea would be buy selfies for the average life expectancy and then buy a deferred longevity hedge, like a deferred annuity, which is now much cheaper to buy because you're buying it on the assumption you live beyond 85. Does that help? So. That helps a lot. One follow-up, though. Um, it's a, a talking point that can be dangerous if it's not properly understood in terms of the public, uh, the press getting out on this, that the, the poorer people are subsidizing the wealthier people. Um, in the United States and Social Security, the, the poor people have a, an embedded interest rate of like 5.8 percent, and the wealthier people have a negative interest rate. And so if you have a negative interest rate for 30 or 40 years of earning, you're and the other people are 7% above you for 40 years. That's a lot, of, a lot of subsidies going the other way. So the question is whether is there really a, is there really a net so, subsidy? So the nice thing about this bond is it removes all those problems, right? That is, today, Social Security, and this is the book we wrote you know, 15 years ago, saying that what's wrong with Social Security isn't the defined benefit. The defined benefit is valuable. It's the way it's financed, the way things are sort of embedded and structured, that you get all sorts of crazy incentives. 
as we move into an economy, and Nuria talked about this, which is digital, right? If your Uber driver is working four hours a day and they don't have an employer, how do they save? A gentleman in Colombia had the idea that when you pay VAT, automatically it buys a small piece of these selfies. So you can start to clean up a lot of these transactions where the implicit subsidization of people that was happening one way or the other can be made cleaner and much more explicit and then managed accordingly. So that was the idea behind the bond. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other question, please? Or reverse, mortgage, or reverse mortgages, the end of pension, <laughs> the end of retirement. I, I have a question. Yes, please. Go ahead. So, so I have a question for Arun. I, I thought this was really fascinating. During your presentation, you said something about if we can use these digital, um, you know, stock pickers or portfolio managers, we can get uh, the answer right 55% of the time, unlike the market, which only goes up 52% of the time. I was thinking about that kind of in a general equilibrium sense. Are you, uh, is, is that, are you just thinking about like individuals can do, be, win more, a higher percentage of the time than the market? Are you saying somehow like the market itself would be more stable if everybody was investing this way? Uh, so, so you raise another great question. Uh, and we used to have a joke when I was at the World Bank's pension plan that before you think you can make money on the market, you have to find the dummy who's willing to lose money. Because if you don't find it, then it's you. Right? <laughs> the funny thing is, because there are so many people following these dumb procedures, the more intelligent ones benefit. right? So I made my clients money in 2008, which was such an outlier, because I had enough people doing the dumb things that finance theory had sort of taught them. And we've had the same experience in 2018. right? So if everybody went to trying to use these GPS mm -hmm. systems, then you're going to get a traffic congestion, right? Just like you find now, is everyone uses the same uh, traffic system. In fact, there are examples in America where people whose roads have become too crowded mm -hmm. are now walking on the street and saying there's a traffic jam so that then you divert mm -hmm. traffic. <laughs> and this is to Nuria's point, is people are putting in fake information to redirect the system. So I think if the entire system gets onto this intelligent platform, then mm -hmm. basically everyone's going to get to 52. But this is an audience where hopefully you're trying to advise people differently. Yeah. So sadly, I think there's a dummy born every minute, uh -huh. which is what you have to try to take advantage of. But great question, yeah. Questions about reverse mortgages, about uh, perceptual intelligence that will help us to discern the difficulties to understand financial products and things like that? <coughs> Miguel. So I have one question that probably uh, goes to everyone there. We have seen um, great ideas that are being apply, applied as we speak, that could be applied within the next few years, that should be applied uh, on a longer uh, term. And while it is important, as you've uh, stressed, the importance of communicating this correctly to policymakers, I think that first we have to disabuse them of the practices that they are engaged in, and so that to clean the slate and, and begin building up on these ideas. So the question is not just to enlighten them, but to uh, make room in their uh, policies and in their minds to begin planting those recommendations. Have you thought about how to do that? Anyone? I'll, I'll start uh, only because I failed completely, right? <laughs> um, and that too, working with a Nobel Prize winner, when we were raising the flag of social security problems, and, and you know this challenge very well, in the late 1990s, we kept saying you have to do something, <laughs> right? Uh, we met with you know, central bank governors, we met with presidents, right, vice presidents, because a Nobel Prize winner gets you these meetings. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew the problem, nobody wanted to act. And I think sadly, if anything, they've made the problems worse mm -hmm. by what action or inaction they did. So the first problem where we tried to save social security failed so badly, that then the question is, can we try to come up with a more market-based solution? And that's why we're now playing with these selfies. Because I think social security globally, and you've seen this in Spain as well, every time they've tried to fix the finances of social security, 
is a reversal immediately, right? So when they said we can't play, you know, we sh can't pay inflation indexation unless there's a surplus, everybody knows there's no surplus, which means then you're not going to get inflation indexation, then you want to reverse the policy. So I think the politicians know it, but because it's a problem they can throw to the future, it's easy for them to just ignore it and hope the next government has to deal with it. So I think the individuals have to solve it, or maybe technology solves it as well. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I agree with Arun a lot in, in the, you know, probably nobody here believes that we're going to look to, you know, the political system to easily solve many of these problems. Um, this is how I ended up spending, moving from spending a lot of my time in Washington, D.C., testifying and writing pieces, et cetera, to deciding to start a company instead which is the view that if we're going to rely on policymakers to fix the problems, it's going to be very, very hard, and government is not very good at dealing with, you know, doing much of this. So, and, it, and you often end up with subsidies going exactly the wrong direction relative to what they should. They go to people who have political clout as opposed to people who don't. That's not the way to run a retirement system or, you know, many systems at all. So... My goal personally and, you know, what we're trying to do with, you know, the company and the industry is to try and do things that can responsibly solve problems, but from outside of the government. The thing is you still need the government to provide safeguards for consumers to have regulation to ensure that financial institutions are able to continue to meet their obligations. So it's not that you can sort of say you're not going to do the government at all, and the government can stop things that are happening. But that's the challenge, is how do you have the right amount of regulation? And I'm not sure that's fixable either. So the question is, what's the best second best that you can get? Any other question? Oh, oh, I yes. can answer, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't uh, have a lot of experience. Um, interacting with uh, politicians and my experience is not necessarily very promising. Uh, I completely agree with Arun. Uh, my experience is that they are very focused on the short term and the short term could be winning the next elections mainly. So I think uh, embarking in transformational um, processes like these, if they don't think that is going to make them more popular, they're not going to do it. So I think a lot of the decisions are based on a political, you know, a sort of like facade. That's what I have learned, not necessarily on what maybe is the best, you know, for the country. At the same time, and this is more happening in Europe than in the U.S., I guess, there is actually a lot of energy on uh, new political parties appearing that have completely disrupted the bipartisan model that, for example, here in Spain we've had, you know, for many years. And that has been completely, I think, I inspiring in a way, because you think, wow, you know, a party that didn't exist, whatever, five years ago, now, you know, uh, of course it depends on the party that you're talking about. But um, So I think for the new, for the younger people, I think this is very inspirational because maybe the hope is actually in having completely new parties that will actually uh, manage to get organized and get traction and, and really change things. I actually think there's more hope on transformation and change happening from new parties than from uh, already established parties that I think have a lot of inertia. That's, if I had to bet something, I would probably bet it's from a newly created party or a young party than from a very old uh, it's like companies, you know, startups are the ones that disrupt, you know, the world, not necessarily the big companies. And I think with politics, in my experience, it's the same. Thank you. Arun, you wanted to? I had a question for both uh, Nuria and Seth, which is, we've gone from having mathematicians and physis physicists in finance to now trying to connect biology to finance. And I was very intrigued by what you said about AI being able to pick up on biology. Because a lot of what we're finding now with behavioral finance is that the theories have a general conclusion about how we behave, but you and I could be completely different even though everything else can look good. And we've also got this problem that we have mass scale financial illiteracy. 
Do you think there's ways in which technology can be pushed to people's phones, right? Because if I'm saving for 60 years for retirement, where that education is ongoing, but it also understands behavioral biases by facial recognition or life events or something like that, is that an interesting role where we can advise people better knowing their behavior and their biology, which we don't have today? Yeah, I mean, from my side, I would say definitely. I think that's... Um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, so that would be a conjunction between using um, machine learning or AI techniques to understand the behavior and then using persuasive computing techniques to try to help change a behavior. So, um, so the positive usages, positive applications of this, which I have done, are a lot of them in well-being and healthcare and education. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of negative things that you can do because what gives you is power to uh, notch behavior, right? So for financial responsibility and for uh, making better financial decisions, I fully agree with you. I think there is a huge uh, lack of uh, knowledge. I think we should teach this more. I think um, teenagers, when they finish high school, they have absolutely no idea, at least in Spain, of any kind of like anything related to the economics really. And, um, and that's definitely not desirable. But then as you say, um, even if you have knowledge, a lot of the products are very complex. And um, I don't know, I always like to apply the rule, if it's too good to be real, it's probably <laughs> not real. Uh, and, uh, and then having, you know, sort of like a smart assistant, you know, in your pocket is totally I mean, there probably already is, I would imagine, you know, and it's totally a, a, a very feasible thing, yeah. So, so I'll, I'll jump in with like maybe a point of optimism here from <laughs> another kind of branch of digitization, which is kind of gamification. Mm. And if you think about the sort of video games that a lot of people are playing, mm. you know, a lot of them, if you actually sit down and crunch the numbers, there's this incredibly kind of deep accounting world of should I use uh, this item or that item and optimizing your gameplay that I think a lot of young people are very engaged in. And uh, so I think that things like games are increasing numeracy amongst people who are engaging with them. And I think it would only be a small step to try to gamify learning about explicit finance topics. And I think people are already learning a lot about these almost financial topics. Yeah, that's true, good that's point. true. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I have a question for Professor, Professor Maya. I, I remember to have heard, uh, to have read once by, uh, by Jim Poteva that the best longevity insurance ever invented is Social Security. <laughs> the thing is that Social Security, Security is not in a position to deliver on this promise today because it is well beyond actuarial uh, criteria, and, and it's absolutely I I um, impossible for, the, for Social Security everywhere in the world to, to pay uh, out their promises. So what, what about using Social Security as an um, insurance of last resort, properly redefined, once reverse mortgages or selfies or things like that have already fulfilled their role? It's an interesting question about, I mean, because what you're pointing out is the idea of insurance should be for catastrophic events. <laughs> um, when people talk about health care insurance, in a sense, health care insurance in most places isn't actually Absolutely. insurance. It is actually paying all or virtually all the costs of health care. And insurance is about sort of people who have bad things happen getting paid for, but not the average set of things happening. It's not an argument against providing health insurance, only that I think it's misnamed as to what, it, as to what is being provided. Um, the, and by the way, Jim Paterba was my thesis advisor at MIT, so yeah, he's, no. uh, um, <laughs> you know, still a friend and somebody who I uh, talk to a lot, so I have a huge amount of respect for Jim. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, I think that we, I do think there's sort of two ways to think about what we would want out of a social security system. One of them is we actually need a floor on income for people who are poor. So Australia, for example, which has gone to, you know, a superannuation, sort of a privatized social security system, has two different 
pieces of the system. One of them is a floor on income that everybody in the country has because you need that so that elderly poverty doesn't become a really serious problem. But then the second is you top it off for people who have additional assets. And by providing a floor to income, you also protect people against running out of assets. So it serves many of the same purposes. I don't know whether it is redistributionist enough relative to what it should be. Um, the thing is, Social Security is inherently redistributionist towards wealthier people because they live a lot longer. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing you could think about is having some kind of means or wealth testing, which sort of has people spend down their assets a little bit. You have to be careful because, again, you have moral hazard problems of, you know, people then never yeah, saving to yeah. retirement. Mm -hmm. So it's a set of very hard problems. But I think some combination of ending up with a floor and longevity insurance provided publicly combined with having people take more of, more of this themselves, I think we're going to have to do that as a society. Whether we're, it's going to end up with means testing of benefits or whatever the approach that we're going to have, the numbers just are, it's not going to work to have a smaller share of younger people working more unless we see significant improvements in productivity yeah. that we're not seeing yeah. that you know the numbers just the math just is not going to work because you can try and tax working people more and more and more and they will just work less or they will go to places where they're not being taxed to avoid it and so it's not a viable system to keep going with what we're what we're doing it's just going to be a matter of what forces what forces us to do it and in what circumstance and hopefully it's not crises that do it but unfortunately the political system sometimes only responds to those things any i have a reaction for yes. chris as well yes <laughs> sorry i'm hogging Go all ahead. the questions Go ahead. Uh, so chris in fact, interestingly, by pure chance, we met for a dinner about a month ago, yes. and then I started to read everything I could about reverse mortgages. <laughs> so I'm so happy to My actually apologies. Get, <laughs> to have Chris in person to learn from. But what I understood is a challenge, both in the US and let's say in Korea and other countries, and maybe also in Spain, is that because the transaction is between banks, who are not the greatest bearers of home price risk, and individuals, uh, there's the risk that either the lender goes out of business or the home price value goes down and therefore some government agency comes and ensures that risk. Right. That adds cost, but then it adds complications. It just makes the transaction inefficient. Are there attempts to try to get away from that to make the transaction a lot cleaner? Because you know, one of the things I feel is missing, and I think you hinted at it in your presentation, is that the pension funds I deal with globally could easily invest in that asset because it has a great return to risk ratio. It's uncorrelated to everything else they hold. And they could be the suppliers of capital and thereby take that risk, which today FHA, or, you know, one of these agencies is bearing. I'd be interested to have your yeah. thoughts on that. Quick answer. Quick answer. Yeah, I think that the right way to deal with risk, aggregate risk as much as possible, is to have is to match assets and liabilities for financial institutions. Reverse mortgages are a very good fit for certain kinds of companies that you described, particularly life insurance companies. They're not a great fit for banks as discussed now. There are some securitization approaches to doing this as well that we could talk about at another time. But I think what you need to do is think about aggregate risk when you're creating these systems because you have to take the risk out of the system as a whole. That's the best way to deal with the risk of financial institutions failing. I'm okay. sorry, but I have to yes, go. Yes, yes, I, I yes, just wanted please. to apologize. No, I just wanted to say that I have to go. So <laughs> okay. thank you so much for the invitation and for the organization. And it's been Thanks a real pleasure. I have learned a lot because this is not my field. And I was just telling Seth and, and all we'll the presentations tuned. I we'll really liked. So thank you so I much. I love this idea of... Uh, of um, Perceptual computing <laughs> and persuasive computing. We need it. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we have still more questions? Please. Uh, just a quick one. Um, it seems that uh, the bottleneck uh, generally seems to be perceived the, politi the politics and the political system 
are they, it's a shame that Nuri is leaving because I was asked, uh, about to ask her, are there any initiatives uh, to make our political system, our democracy, to be better using technology? Because it seems to be like a very old system to only vote every four years. Uh, I mean, the pension system has been criticized because it seems to be old enough. But democracy is, uh, is probably old enough Perhaps, or uh, c so. could be better. And uh, with uh, the use of proper technology and uh, using filters that uh, um, avoid uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the bad use of it. But a good angle would be like uh, people can vote real-time decisions and make it the system better. And uh, I just wonder, are there any uh, initiatives to make democracy better using technology? Hmm. That's clear. I, I was um, probably is more about the big data and uh, what you know the proper use the proper patterns that people do in their lives can actually this all the massive amount of data really make a uh, artificial intelligence in the future to make better decisions well, for the community you can get always read on twitter but uh, <laughs> nuria yeah. must must leave for the ways um i worry about it because, uh, Seth, thank you very much, uh, Nuria. Uh, Seth can. Uh, uh, well, I'll say there are a couple. A of, uh, sure. I mean, there are a couple of interesting ideas in there. Um, so I've heard of kind of a lot of ideas for trying to use um, more engaged populaces and other ways to try to enhance the quality of democracy. Uh, one proposal is Glenn Wiles' quadratic voting, which is supposed to be a more sophistic way, sophisticated way of aggregating people's different views into an aggregate result. So that's something I would look into. Um, there are proposals such as um, the idea that the government would make all of its policies based on the predictions of betting markets. So we know that prediction markets are pretty good at making predictions about the future, and presumably lots of individuals would use machine learning systems to make those predictions. And if you could somehow get the government to harness the power of those prediction markets when they're making their analyses, you know, then you wouldn't have the CBO making these completely unrealistic predictions about what the government debt's going to look like based on laws that are on the books, but no one really realistically believes are going to be the imp in implemented policies. Um, as for the question of whether a more engaged, whether a populist who had, had like kind of instant voting on all of these issues would improve the quality of governance, I think that's an open question. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of um, concern these days that there's a lot of uninformed voting <laughs> and voting in ways that I think reveals some sort of issues with democracy as a way of aggregating people's information. Let me give you an example of that. So in uh, the Brexit uh, <laughs> debates right now, it seems that there's been an instance of something called uh, Arrow's Impossibility Theorem, where there's a group of people, so it, apparently in England or in the UK right now, there's a majority that supports uh, no deal over the current deal support uh, May's deal, supports May's deal over remaining in the EU, and yet supports remaining in the EU, or no, it supports no deal over remaining in the EU. So you've got this cycle of views where even if every individual has like a rational ordering of preferences, society might end up with this ordering of preferences that just doesn't work out. And that's, I think, just one example of, you know, we're not going to be able to vote our way. Huh, <laughs> so it, it, the solution isn't just, you know, asking people what their opinion is sometimes, right? Sometimes there has to be an expert who's empowered to make the decision, of course, ratified by democracy and with democracy with the power to throw out governors who are incompetent or corrupt. <laughs> but it's not clear that the solution to this problem is more direct to democracy, although perhaps the solution is more oversight over leaders. Okay. Um, now uh, to... Uh, just said the final dot to this to this uh, conference uh, this year. I'll ask any one of you just a basic and stride recommendation for governments. Uh, what you uh, understand is the synthesis from this uh, conference. Uh, Chris, please. 
I have to have one quick <laughs> bullet point. Um, that's it. I can start we if you're thinking. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll see. Issue selfies. <laughs> Use selfies. Okay, good. 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 All right, I'll go next. Um, new technologies have two distributional implications. One is they increase inequality within a generation, and the second is their transfers from the current young to the current old, from current workers to current retirees, both through government debt and through uh, other mechanisms. And we should be fair and try to redistribute the gains from technological change, both to reduce inequality within a generation and to help future generations. Thank you. Mayer? Yep. Um, we need to find a path to responsibly using home equity um, in the retirement process. Thank you very much. <laughs>